Testing one, two, three, internet. Internet, can you hear me? You probably can't see me because you're still seeing the intro image that I have uh, showing uh, the 1998 video game uh, Thief the Dark Project along with uh, uh, starting at 5 p.m. notice, which I think I think it'll be a minute, a minute late. Just checking if you can hear me. Do you copy? Do you copy? And are you drinking your chocolate wine with me? That is the question. Because if you're not drinking chocolate wine with me, I will have the moderators ban you immediately. That is a strict requirement for you to be on the stream. <laughs> all right. All right. I know you guys don't want to listen to me at all. You want to listen to the guest that I have today. And, you know, if you guys think you're excited to talk to him, I don't think you've known me or how I grew up. Uh, <laughs> Uh, searching for video games that were on PC that were 3D and I look for the people behind the the engines and things like that. So trust me, I am really excited to have Mr. Sean Barrett. I'm, and I'm not sure if I should call him Sean or if I should call him Sir Barrett, the coding wizard. Um, I think I'll ask him myself. Uh, Sean, can you hear me? Wait, hold on. Don't talk. Don't talk. I think... I think you're still muted, and maybe OBS is still causing issues here. Uh, hello? Sean? Oh my god, we can't hear you. That's awful. There, there it is. I found my mute button. Sorry. <laughs> Alright, I was scared. I was scared for a sec. Alright, so is it Sean or is it Sir Barrett? What should I call you? I think Sean is fine. You think Sean's fine? Okay, aw. All right, no problem. Um, thank you for being here, man. Welcome to the Handmade Dev Show. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, oh, trust me, it, it's, it's an honor. And what we're gonna do here, um, it looks like everybody's pretty excited here, awesome. Um, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna talk about, uh, well, for those who don't know, let me just start here. I'm sure there are some new viewers here. Like, I haven't seen FFSJS, that's an interesting username, FFSJS. I haven't seen him, and I haven't seen Raoul de Berger. Sorry, I can't pronounce the names correctly. So uh, for those who don't know, this interview stream, Handmade Dev Show, is a, a way for us to interview guests uh, that are well-known in their field uh, and to pick their brains and see how they began their programming careers, how they got interested in programming in the first place, and how they become you know, successful. Um, and then on the second half of the stream, we start talking about handmade dev things, what they think about handmade dev and why they're supporting it or why they're not supporting it. And then we'll take, you know, Q&A from the, from the chat. So you guys can prepare your questions for Mr. Barrett right now, because uh, on the second half of the stream, uh, I'll have him answer most of them, ho hopefully. So your, your audio is breaking up a little bit for me. Is that my headphones or is that there are people on the stream here that... Uh, it might be a Hangouts thing. It's happened before, um, which kind of sucks. So do, right. you, do you hear like a robotic voice? No, it's just uh, really crackly. Oh, that's bad. Well, we'll try to fix it soon. Um, but you're not here to listen to me. <laughs> We're here to listen to you, man. So why don't you tr uh, take us back, pretend that nobody knows who you are, Sean. Pretend nobody in this chat knows what you've done. Um, you've been frozen and taken into the future 100 years later, uh, where programming is not this sect of religious wars between languages. <laughs> and, and they talk to you and they're like, what did you do? How did you get into programming and how did you become successful? So, you know, take us back to Sean Barrett, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, um, and, <laughs> and try to bring us up to speed uh, with your life. All right. So, let's see. Um... I started programming uh, when I was maybe 12 or so, um, which is a long time ago now. Uh, so, boy, uh, I should just know this off the top of my head. I guess that would be something like 1979. Uh, I'm a child of the 70s. Uh, oh, wow. And, um, you know, before I started programming at that point, you know, we had very primitive video games, the Atari 2600. Uh, which my family had one of those, and I played that. Mm -hmm. And um, 
before we got a computer, I, my mother reminded me of this a few years ago. I used to be really obsessed with making mazes. I would oh. just make them. I don't know that they were interesting mazes or anything, but they, you know, that was the, that was the thing. So that sort of turned, I think that's the origins of the sort of game designer part of my, uh, yes. my life, which we were, which we're not going to talk about. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, but, you know, it kind of all connects together a little bit, the game dev and the programming. So, uh, so 12, uh, started high school, got a computer, uh, actually started programming at work, uh, at, at school. Uh, and then we got a home computer and, you know, uh, an 8-bit, uh, Atari 8-bit and, uh, was programming basic on that, per started learning assembly on it so I could get it to go faster. Nice. Uh, and go ahead. No, no. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. And, uh, my, uh, school library, um, I had two magazines, uh, Creative Computing and Byte Magazine. Uh, and Byte Magazine was much more technical. Um, and I started uh, consuming those pretty religiously. And there was an article which uh, maybe a year or two ago, I retweeted, I dug it up online. There's the, the, all the archives of Byte, which was uh, doing 3D graphics. And, uh, you know, it was uh, covered the math, covered some linear algebra that you needed to know and some other stuff. and. Uh, you know, so that was in my teens. I, I learned that stuff. Couldn't do it on the Atari 8-bit very well, but I, you know, <laughs> did what I could. Um, uh, and then I went to college. Um, and in college, uh, I was a computer science major and a philosophy major, both. Oh, uh, wow. I didn't know that. Um, nice. Yeah, well, and so in the end, I decided that philosophy, uh, once I had received enough of a philosophy education, I decided the philosophy education was worthless. So I don't really talk about it that much. Oh, gotcha. Uh, it sort of uh, negates itself. It becomes it, it becomes clear how irrelevant it is to itself um, when you get into it. No, for my, for, in my taste. Anyway, so programming. Uh, so in college, um, I got away from graphics because, you know, on the Atari, I was doing games and graphics. And then when I was in college, we were using Unix machines mostly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I started, uh, no, that's, that's, let's forget that tangent. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so I, uh, so I spent many, too many years in college. Uh, and basically, you know, I got an IBM PC, but, uh, I was staying with the sort of text, um, you know, like text adventures and stuff like that stuff that wasn't graphical. Uh, but when I, uh, was there anything else interesting in the college stuff? Not really. Hey, it's college. Um, right. So uh, in, I'll put a year on one of these for the first time. So in 1992, I graduated college. Uh, I'd really only been doing uh, this sort of Unix programming. I was doing, you know, I'd written uh, multiple interpreters and uh, written a, the implementation of a malloc. I'd done a bunch of technical stuff that had nothing to do with my classes. Okay. Was it just... A hobby? Side projects? Yeah, yeah. So because I'd always been programming on the Atari, it was, you know, the the college education and programming was secondary to my programming career. Like, it, I learned some stuff that I wouldn't have easily picked up otherwise, but I was a programmer independent of college. I That was why, part of why I got the philosophy degree was the college I was going to wasn't that strong in computer science. And I was like, maybe I shouldn't bother with the computer <laughs> science degree. I can program fine. I don't need it. Uh, yeah, and but I'll you, do something else. So I you, spent a lot of time. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Did you get any value out, out of your programming degree at all then? I uh, Some. Um, you know, uh, my data structures class, you know, gave me a sort of fast tour of a lot of that kind of stuff. And uh, there's a particular algorithm called the uh, plane sweep rectangle intersection algorithm. Um, which I immediately applied at my very first job. Uh, you know, I had learned it two years earlier and then I got to this job and they're like, yeah, we don't know how to solve this problem <laughs> of intersecting these rectangles efficiently enough. Uh, and I'll actually explain that in a second. I might as well, that'll be an, a fun thing to dive down into. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but for the most part, yeah, no, like most of what I got, out, most of the computer science curriculum was checking off marks. I mean, so, you know, the, the class in computer architecture was really good. I got to, you know, learn more details about how computers work deep down. I knew some of that stuff and uh, the, the sort of more rigorous approach, mainly because there's that uh, Hennessy and Patterson book 
uh, that they keep revising that is sort of a canonical thing that for yeah. education. And that's just a really strong book. Those, those guys are, it wasn't my instructor. It was that book was really solid. <laughs> um, yeah. Not to knock, I don't even know who the teacher was, but yeah. Uh, and I took two classes from the guy who invented skip lists. So you know, oh. that's a, the, 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 at, at least at the time, it was like the only modern data structure. It's a terrible data structure that nobody uses in practice, <laughs> but it's like when you learn data structures, it's like the only one that wasn't invented in the 60s, it seems like. Okay, gotcha. And he happened to be at my university, so. Um, anyway. Yeah, yeah, go on. Uh, so yeah, you know, I, I was avoiding the computer science degree and that was, I took a lot of classes in different subjects and uh, to try to find what else I could major in and eventually went down the philosophy path, path looking for that. But once I was a little ways down the philosophy path, I was like, uh, I might as well do the computer science as well. And I did a double degree, mm. um, except that I didn't actually technically get the philosophy. I like met all the requirements for the philosophy degree and I didn't get it. And I, when that happened, I, for lack of a better term, it was just, you know, bureaucratic snafu. It's not, that's not really accurate, but close enough. But I was like, you know what? It's just not worth my time. I'm graduating. I'm going to go get a job programming. I don't need the philosophy degree. I'm not going to worry about yeah, it. So you just let it go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I just tell everyone, Hey, I can re met the requirements for the philosophy degree. So don't actually have it. Anyway, because it's worthless, I don't mind not having it. Yeah, but you're a philosopher though now. Like you can call no. yourself that. <laughs> yeah, I could. Well, only a, I'm, I'm not a doctor of philosophy, so I only got a bachelor's, you know, or worked on a bachelor's. So. I see. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so I graduated and I went to uh, Texas. So uh, this was all on the East Coast. And I went to Texas because there was a little company that some friends of mine were working at that uh, was founded by some grad uh, some ex-grad students from Texas A&M. So it was where Texas A&M was. Mm -hmm. And I went to Texas for two years to work at this company that was basically a startup made software that lived inside printers. So it took PostScript as input and needed to output a bitmap. Okay. Uh, and they had that whole system going and we were porting it to new systems. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting tech in there. Uh, but one of the things was that to solve some of the problems that they had, they sent the text that was rendered by a different route than the graphics. And the text, you know, had little bounding squares or rectangles. And so what they needed to do was detect if graphics ever got drawn on top of text and process the text specially if that happened. Yeah. And that was why they needed the rectangle intersection was to find those, those collisions. So I spent two years doing that and doing text muds. Uh, but the important thing that happened there was that these other guys who I knew uh, online, that was how I got found out about the job. Um, we started uh, playing games on the IBM PC that were graphics games. So we played Ultima 7 and we played Ultima Underworld. And the, so this is 92 to 94. And uh, so I started getting back into like the graphic, having graphics in around and uh, one or two of the other programmers, uh, we found Michael Abrash's Dr. Dobbs series on mode X programming and gra 3D graphics programming, which is coming out. I think it had come out a little few months earlier and our, uh, the company had uh, the whichever magazine Dr. Dobbs had had those stocked up. So we went through them and we competed with each other to write a little 3D graphics uh, programming thing and, uh, you know, just nice. drawing lots of cubes, drawing whatever. I made a sort of Ultima Underworld clone uh, graphics engine, not the not, none of the game. <laughs> uh, and then that, that company that we were at went belly up and, oh. I, and I had to get a new job. And oh, wow. uh, I knew online a guy who worked at this company called Looking Glass Technologies. At oh the my time. God. <laughs> Looking Glass Studios there. And I knew him online and uh, in a totally different, it was sort of a creative writing group uh, oh. for sort of weird, weird creative writing. And it was on Usenet. And uh, for games? I knew he had, writing for uh, games? Or? No, no, it was just a writing, just people writing. It had nothing to do with games. But oh. there was this guy. I didn't know him personally, he was just in that group. Uh, and I knew they had done that game and I had loved that game and yeah. I was, and I was in Texas and they were in Boston. Uh, and so I, uh, and, but they were published by this company called origin, um, mm -hmm. uh, who had done the Ultimas and origin was in Texas. So I emailed this guy that I sort of knew and I said, Hey, uh, I need a job. 
can you give me pointers to uh, or connect me up with yeah. somebody in Texas so I can go work for Origin? Mm. And he was like, why don't you come up here and work <laughs> for us instead? Right. Uh, so, so I sent them a bunch of demos and they loved them. And, uh, and I went to Looking Glass. Um, and I spent seven years at Looking Glass. Uh, and so Looking Glass is this company that made the Ultima Underworld, made System Shock 1, yes. um, collaborated with System Shock 2, made Thief of the Dark Project and Thief 2. Oh, God, yes. Uh, made some games called Flight Unlimited and Flight Unlimited 2. Um, and those are all interesting things that I can talk about, but my involvement with them was limited other than Thief. So I don't know if right. we want to go into the game stuff at all or not. Oh, we will. Um, I don't know if you want to continue with your uh, timeline. I can do it. And I can just do the timeline and then we can come back. Exactly. That's... That'll be awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so I worked there uh, for seven years and that company struggled financially uh, a lot, mm -hmm. uh, got acquired, got sold. Um, you know, it would, the problem was that we were sort of making intellectual games that had sort of a limited appeal. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, that's sad. To, to uh, I mean, it had, it had good appeal, but just not quite enough. And Thief was sort of our big breakthrough, but it wasn't enough uh, to to keep the whole company going. In fact, we released Thief Two and almost immediately closed. I think we probably never saw the money from Thief Two. So, Jesus, um, just one of those how one of those things goes. So, yeah. uh, that was two thousand one when that shutdown happened. Um, and so then I decided I'm going to try being an indie game developer, and yeah. I just started launched out to be an indie game developer. Uh, and over the next seven years, um, I didn't finish any of the large uh, indie games that I was trying to make. Okay. I released a few games that I basically wrote the game in a weekend, but I couldn't finish the games that were lar longer than that. Mm -hmm. um, and all those games are available for free. Um, nice. And then uh, 2008, uh, I helped a little bit on uh, Braid, the game by Jonathan Blow, yes. who just released The Witness. So I did a little bit of programming on Braid. And then I was like, you know, this indie, indie game development thing just isn't working out for me and I got to get a real job. And of course, Braid was sort of around the time when indie games went from being, uh, it, it was sort of the golden age of indie, game, indie mm -hmm. games right after that. So mm -hmm. it's possible I picked the wrong time to step out. But <laughs> since it was largely because I was failing, not because of the market. Um, I, I, it was probably still the right choice. And so then 2008, I went to work for Rad Software. Um, and I'll have to come back a little bit to connect the dots here. But yes. uh, my... Looking for a link? Uh, my Firefox just crashed. Oh, duh. That's... <laughs> But so. apparently the plugin keeps running or something. Oh, maybe now it died. Because, I mean, we're still talking. Yeah, is my video gone though? No, no, you look perfect. All right, there's, well. There's no issue. This is weird. The uh, browser crashed, but the plugin kept running because it's in a separate process. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know if I can reconnect Hangouts and actually see anything at this point. But that's okay. As long as it's working, it's working. All right, so. Yeah, it is. So um, let's just forget about that and move on. <laughs> It's awful though. <laughs> uh oh.
speak to me. Sean, speak to me. Here I am. All right. <laughs> All right. Tell me where I was when it died. Yeah. Um, let me just see if I can get you up on the OBS thing again. Oh, yeah. Uh, all right. So it seems like it'll work. I just have to shut down the camera from the Hangouts area. Um, and then go back here. All right. Yeah, it looks perfect. Uh, let me I have some music on. Let me turn that off. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Firefox did not win against us. We are stronger than software. Um, I hope. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, we're good. Um, all right, Sean, I think you left talking about, you know, you did seven years of indie game development, but it didn't really turn out to be your thing. And then I think it stopped from there. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so I, you know, um, I had done some contract work while I was uh, doing the indie Indie development just to have cash flow, and one of the things I had done was to, did some work for Rad, making the Vorbis library, uh, which is uh, one of the STB libraries, which I'll come back to. So um, I had been doing these STB libraries that um, were pretty related to the work that Rad does. Rad makes um, game software libraries for professional developers, and so there was an obvious relationship there. And the owner of Rad was. Uh, pretty sure that that would be a good fit, so he offered me the job, and he had asked in the past, and this this at this point I was ready to give up and and try something new. So, so I went ahead with that and went to Rad. Uh, it's not really that interesting there. Um, I make a uh, a software um, that's basically Flash Player that you put in your game for the user interface. You author your user interface in Flash. So I'm the sole author of this Flash Player, basically. <laughs> wow. Um. And that, and that brings us to now. So the thing that I kind of skipped over there was the STB libraries because it's a really small portion of what I do with my life and with programming. Yeah. So, um, but it's sort of what I'm known for, at least in these communities. So, uh, I, so I want to circle back to it a little bit. Okay. Uh, and the origin of that um, is a little complicated. I have uh, multiple things came together that led to that. So one of the stories there is that when I was at Looking Glass, I had a library that I needed to write to get something done, and it had nothing to do with games. It was just a, a programming, meta programming y kind of thing. And, yeah. um, and I wrote it and I got that thing done. And then when I was doing the indie stuff, I was like, you know what would be useful would be this library. And it's too late. Like that was Looking Glass library. It's gone. Like there's nothing I can do. So I was like, I, you know, I've got to write it again. Yeah. Um, but, and, and there's nothing I can do about that now, but maybe in the future when I have other libraries, I can avoid that. And so I'm going to have, I told myself, and there was no guarantee this would work, I would have a policy of trying to make these libraries uh, that I did for companies reusable. And the way, one, a way of uh, doing that was to either do it on my own time rather than as part of their time. But, you know, maybe they don't care. They, they'd be willing to, you know, uh, if I'm giving it away to everyone. Gotcha. And, and I make them public domain so that, you know, if I'm on contracting on a project, I can just drop it in and I don't have to worry about them fighting about whether that's okay. Um, and technically, if it were open source, I could still license, if it were my software, I could still license it under another Precisely. thing. How many, it wouldn't have to be open source for them. But I just don't even want to have that debate. And I just didn't see enough value to putting an open source license on it. Um, wow. for the isn't, kind of stuff that I'm doing. Isn't that a critical radical thing to do back then, though? Um, it, it is and it isn't. I certainly don't know anyone else who was doing it at the time. The exactly. SQL light is, is public domain, and that was probably at the same time, but I didn't know about it at the time. Um, one inspiration was there was an artist who was just doing sketches, and he was putting them in the public domain. And so when I started doing these things that I call the music sketchbook, because uh, I'm also a musician, yeah. um, and, they're, and they're just like sketches, so they're, they're kind of demos. They're not really high quality. But I was just like, you know, I'm never going to make money from music, so why bother? And I just put, put those things in the public domain as well. So I'd already kind of been exposed to that. Um, it was also after we'd done the Indie Game Jam, which isn't public domain or anything, but it was um, just kind of had an influence on my perception of crediting and value and stuff like that. And, you know, it's um, the public domain thing is partly just gets it out of, just makes it easier for everyone um, involved. Oh, yeah, and, for sure. uh, you know, there's... Um, 
it, it's sort there's a sort of viral nature to that too, not in the <laughs> sense of the GPL, but in the sense that um, you know, if I want the most number of people to use it, you know, put the make it the easiest as easy as possible for the maximum number of people to use it. And so that's sort of the one of the philosophies behind yes. the STP libraries. Um, you know, which is one of the things like Casey will talk about. Uh, don't know if he's talked about it on Hamid Hero, but the idea that, uh, or actually, I guess John Blow has talked about it more, which is this idea that people release these things, but they don't go, you know, like they'll do an ac academics or somebody will release something. And when it's just a research project, that's fine. But if they go ahead and open source it, it's like, you know, go the extra distance to make sure it's easy to build and et cetera. Don't like just throw it up on the web and say, well, maybe somebody gets some value from it. It's like, that's a very pervasive um, mindset that's still going on today. It, it is. And I, it's just a sort of a human thing. I, I'm trying to think of it and out. Like, I've seen this in unrelated to programming circumstances, and I can't think of a good example. But uh, one would be, um, you know, just somebody who, you know, uh, I've got this archive of stuff and I'm dumping it here. I hope somebody gets some use out of it. Um, but it needs to be sorted through. And if you can do a distributed sort if everyone can work together to sort through it that's fine but if it's this thing where everyone downloads it separately and then yeah. they all have to sort through it you're just everyone's doing the same work over and yes. over again. yes so so it, it, it's it's un, it's understandable from the laziness sense that the people would do that but the the difference in value there because if there's no way to distribute that sort uh, that uh uh organizing yeah if everyone does have to do it you're, you're wasting so many people's time so uh, so it's that same philosophy. Yeah. So it's 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 a. Th I guess if you want to look at it from the perspective of a product, they're not really releasing a product because a product should have that uh, organizational you know thing imbued in it. Like it, sh it should already be primed for people to use in a way that's like you said, easy to deploy, easy to to make use of. Now, before you continue with your timeline, I do have a question for you. Um, so you know, you said 1992. I was a year old. <laughs> Yeah. And it was 1992. And I grew up in this environment of programming where I know it's vastly different from your environment, right? Like if I go to class or if I go to work, well, not necessarily work. I work at a good place. But, you know, with friends that are outside of work or with a school, uh, the way they program is vastly different from what I think was in the past, which is, you know, they just look at some things that, you know, Google or Yahoo or whatever. They look at solutions that have already been posted for their kind of problem. And then they're just stitching together these uh, black boxes to get their Frankenstein code to work. And I'm wondering if that was the case with you or how was the programming environment with you, with your coworkers? How is that different from, let's say, today? Um, well, so one thing is I can't say, like, um, I'm not very good at making analogies to today because I don't actively work in that kind of environment myself. <laughs> yeah. um, so I just hear the horror stories. Oh, so, God. Um, yeah. It's always bad. It's, there's never a, a, a... I'm sorry. Go on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, um, so, you know, one of the things, as I said, um, so I was thinking we talk about this more with the, when we get to talking about Hamid, but um, I, there's this uh, there's this whole thing where the people from my generation, we grew up on these computers that uh, you just turn the computer on and you could instantly start programming it. Um, and, uh, everything ran at 60 frames per second. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, I tan terrible tangent here, but I, I sure, can't no, no, no problem. I, I can't figure out how to unpack this <laughs> without the tangent, because <laughs> if you're young enough that you don't know what a CRT is, I kind of have to explain that. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, uh, in graphics programming, you have this, uh, buffer that represents an image that is somehow getting sent to your monitor. So just something somewhere in the system transmits this image to your monitor and it comes into your monitor sequentially. It's sending a pixel at a time, maybe top left, uh, you know, to bottom right. Um, mm. And the, you know, the LCD that's potentially is displaying all of them at the same time. Um, but there is still that sort of serial uh, sequence of pixels going on. Yeah. And uh, back in the day, we had these things called CRTs, where that was actually an analog process that was uh, just part of the display mechanism, which is that uh, instead of having all these independent lights on your screen, you had a big array of phosphors, and there was a an electron gun shooting a beam of electrons at these phosphors to make them light up, and it would sweep across the thing, top left to bottom right, very, very fast, uh, and you would modulate the intensity of the beam to turn individual phosphors bright and dark wow. as it swept. Uh, 
And so the analog signal you're sending across to a CRT is how bright the electron beam needs to be as it sweeps. But you're not controlling the sweep. The, the monitor is controlling the sweep. Oh so there's this incredible synchronization going on there. Upshot of all that is that that analog signal that's coming out of your computer or you know, Atari 2600 back then, it was generated from a digital processor displaying the graphics. Yeah. Um, but it had to just generate those, you know, uh, those signals uh, in time, you know, representing what was being displayed. Now, we're used to thinking that there, you have this pre-built image and you're just sending out this, the pixels of this image. But on those very, very early th systems like the Atari 2600 or Pong before that, mm -hmm. um, they didn't have memory for the frame buffer is what that's called. And so they would just dynamically generate exactly the data you needed on the fly somehow. Uh, so in something like Pong, uh, there's three objects on the screen, and there's just a little bit of logic that at every pixel decides uh, which object can you see at this point, which color should I be. There's just a little circuit that could do that. You know, it's not like a shader or something. It's uh, just this physical circuit. Wow, you're blowing yeah. my mind here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the Atari 2600 was uh, like the more advanced version of that where it had a computer driving, you know, a CPU driving this process, but there was still circuitry doing this compositing of for things dynamically as uh, as it's generating the analog signal to send to the monitor or TV, actually, yeah. you know, to display that final signal. Uh, and that's that whole process is called racing the beam because the idea is that the CPU oh. has to sit there keeping track of where it is like you, while you're writing the code. It doesn't act, you keep track of it. You're keeping track of where the electron beam basically is conceptually. Um, as as your code is executing. That was the, the notorious thing about the 2600. And there's a very interesting book called Racing the Beam, if you want to know more about this. But uh, why uh, did that happen? OK, is this because of memory constraints? Was it? Yes, was so the Atari 2600 had 128 bytes of RAM. Bytes? Bytes. That was because, because memory was incredibly expensive back then. In this particular case, that's on-chip memory, and there was no off-chip memory at all. Um, so, you know, they, they're uh, making a consumer product and RAM is really expensive, uh, you know, so yeah. they just, there was there was no actual off-chip RAM. There was just the, the memory on the chip. I need to bow down now to you guys. How did you so I never I never programmed the Atari 2600. Uh, I, you Seriously, I do recommend that book, Racing the Beam, if you want to know more. I'll definitely about check it out. It's, it's aimed at a semi-non-technical level. So, you know, he got, kind of goes into technical details and kind of doesn't in, a, I think, a good balanced way. So whatever technical level you're at, it's, it's useful. Uh, it's uh, by Nick Momfort and I forget the other author, but Racing the Beam, search on Amazon or whatever. Oh, yeah, somebody in the um, chat already linked to the, the link to the book. Yep. So thank there you, you Dr. Jeans. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, where was I? Okay, so right, so you have all this crazy racing going on. Now, what was why did I bring this up? What was I what was I tangenting from? <laughs> you, were uh, you were talking about it's only 128 bytes, and then you had to do this back then as opposed to now. Um, yeah, yeah, but so what was I? What was I original? My original branch point from this? What did I? Uh, why did I start this tangent? Uh, not too much wine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm waiting for somebody in the chat to to tell me why what where I was when I started the tangent. Yeah, so surely somebody will remember. Yeah, hopefully. Um, um, yeah, I'm completely lost. Oh, how you made that? Yeah, old enough to know what a CRT is, but what? Uh, Public domain. Oh, that's too far back. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, there was some actual point I had. I was going for, and I don't. 60, I'm not, 60 frames per second. There right. you go. That was Woo. it. So the whole thing is because those things were just generating the image directly as the frame was happening. There was no reason that the very next frame had to be the same. You know, you mm. were. Uh, the Atari 2600 was computing off of a few hardware registers, so you could easily update those every frame. There was no good reason not to just run your game at 60 frames per second. On the 8-bit computers, it's a little bit different, but it was still pretty commonplace to have games that ran at 60 frames per second. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, something like the Apple II, that wasn't true, but uh, the, right. the ones that had graphics hardware built into them, that was very common. Um, so we had this environment in which we kind of took for granted um, that uh, you know that that you could easily program your devices and that they should be slick and responsive. You know, Casey has talked about the um, whatever the Amiga editor was that's super slick and responsive. Yeah, um, but it was, that, this was out of, out of necessity. Was what? Yeah. Well, well, no. In that case, that was so. That was the programmer being very careful to make sure that all was achieved. But it was because by that point, you know, on the Amiga, you did have a full frame buffer. Um, 
but that was we were used to had that experience so he there was more incentive for him to want to get that going back. okay yeah so um so yeah so we're, we were talking about that <laughs> the question was about the difference in the, the yes, program yes. things and so one of the things that uh was interesting to me about handmade um is that like the handmade manifesto and and just dev in general um yeah is that you know we i've come from this previous generation where we really had we were really used to this stuff and I, you know, I kind of looked, you know, disparagingly as an old man, you know, <laughs> get off my lawn, old man, kind of old man, at all the JavaScript frameworks and all that stuff, and feel like that curmudgeonliness is in part because of my age. So it's really, really nice to see uh, the next generation, some people going, this makes no sense, <laughs> this is all terrible, everyone is doing it wrong. It's not that those old fuddy duddies are right just that it is inherently wrong like uh <laughs> that's super awesome um so Absolutely. like i said i don't have much direct exposure to that stuff to compare them i just have exposure to people bitching about it and <laughs> your your, re your you as a group's reaction to that yes and you know tell you what most of the community here are really young people right we're talking 19 20 21 yep. Um, that's sort of the demographic that the community is targeted towards even though we have obviously older programmers um so I don't know. It seems like every generation has these people that really understand you know, what, what it means to program something that's of high quality and that's performant. But why do you think that most companies and most people in the software industry, because we're really a minority, right? Yeah, and I, yeah. I believe we're always going to be a minority. I don't know your thoughts on that. But like, why, why is it rampant? Why is software so bloated and shitty and broken? <laughs> Why is that the case? If we had quality software back then, was the necessity to do that removed because of all the power? Is that it? Is that all? I don't know what you think. But. I. It, <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's such a to, it's yeah. such a speculative question. I, know, I mean, I know. So yeah, I mean, fair, yeah I maybe. Like I, I kind of don't. Like I can't even express why I don't want to express an opinion like without <laughs> sounding like a blowhard here. But. Um, you know, as an experienced, skilled hacker, yeah. you know, for lack of, you know, in the traditional hacker sense, <laughs> like I consider myself in sort of the upper echelon of programmers. And so it's very easy for me to kind of look at all these other people and just go, well, they're not that good. They don't know what they're doing. They are just, you know, scrabbling in the dirt, trying to figure out how to make it work. So, of course, it's all messed up. But I, that, that's sort of my natural instinct but i'm also self-reflective enough to know that i sure. just don't really know and like, there may be forces that make sense i mean one of the things is that um that could be a factor uh, and may not be a factor it's just that like the role of what computers do is very different now from what right. they did 30 years ago you need a lot more of it it's doing a lot more different stuff you yeah. know you have a hundred million lines of code in a car or whatever you know there uh, that's just this huge I, I, and i and i pick that one data point out trying to imply that there's this huge spectrum of things that are being done. Uh, and so there is just a lot more software and uh, conditions are different. Yeah, like it's really hard to say. It's, it's hard to say and you know, but schools though, schools value a, a way of programming that just doesn't consider you to, to go and dig behind the scenes. It's more like just leverage the tools that people have already created. Yeah. Um, and that's probably not a good thing. So I guess that's- Yeah, the well, there was, it just crashed again. Oh my god. <laughs> Do you think you'll survive this time? Um, uh, I should probably switch to Chrome, but it may take me a while to get that installed into Chrome. Well, I think we're supposed to have a break right now, right? So All right. Uh, why don't we have well, a three to five minute break, okay? And then we'll yep. come back and we'll talk more about programming things, the Thief project, and more handmade dev things, all right? All right. So see you guys in three to five minutes. Grab your beers. Go to the bathroom and we'll be right back. And also prepare your questions for Sean Barrett because we're going to have him answer your questions directly from the viewers. Thank you.
right. Okay, I gotta get my drink, so I might I might take a little bit, but Hello, Internet. Welcome to the second half of this interview stream with the one and only Sean Barrett, uh, lead engine developer of Thief, the dark project from 1998, and the author of the widely popular STB libraries. Um, I'm very excited to talk to him. I've been following his, uh, his work and his adventures for years, actually. So it's been a fun, interesting talk, uh, despite technical difficulties. <laughs> um, I'd be hard pressed to believe for people to not even have heard of the name uh, Thief, the Dark Project, right? So I am playing a, a quick um, video of the game from Johnny Fox. Uh, I'm wondering if Sean is with me. Uh, can you hear me, Sean? Yeah, I can. All right, perfect. So we were talking about a lot of interesting things by the end of, of the first half, but we'll pick it up a little bit later if, if it's okay with you, just so you can talk about Thief, the dark project, and what you did in that engine um, at a high level if you want to, and whether or not you enjoyed it, if you would do it again, things like that, just a high level you know, overview. Sure. Um... Uh, I'm typing and checking. Okay. No problem. Um, so, um, I wasn't the lead engine developer. I was the lead renderer developer. The engine in a game does many things besides the rendering. And the only thing I had control over was the rendering. 
Gotcha. It's the thing that everyone's sort of most familiar with because the graphics are like what you see immediately. Yeah. And so it feels like what you're seeing is the graphics and the level design. And I think that sort of feels like what's there. But there are very large teams making these games. And uh, the rendering is, is a, one of the most complicated technically usually, mm -hmm. but not, not the, necessarily the, even the largest uh, programming part of the team. Uh, and on Looking Glass in particular back in these days, um, this was very uh, different. Um, I'll t talk a little bit more um, uh, in a second, but um, what, you know, uh, the the big thing at the time was something like Quake. Uh, this is a very similar engine to Quake, and you know what happened at a company like id Software was to some extent John Carmack was sort of like, well, what what's the what's a neat technology I, I can do? Um, now let me design this engine sort of around pushing this technology as far as it can be pushed. And then let's, to some extent, design the game around uh, e exploiting that technology really well. Um, and at Looking Glass, I would make this technology and then the designers could say, okay, I really want the game to work this way. So, you know, we're just going to use this engine that way. It doesn't matter. That's not what it was intended to do or it's not the most efficient use of that engine. Now, I, that's a sort of parody of the an exaggeration of things like they were certainly aware of the limitations and in the same at the same time something like doom was very clearly um a strong design it wasn't like a design that was hampered by the constraints of the technology um but you know, so there's always an, a little bit of a feedback between the two but but to a certain extent that was sort of true and so um, you know, when I went to Looking Glass, I sort of had this philosophy of, uh, well, surely, since these are software rendered, surely, and, and, and the graphics is this intense thing that's got to produce all these pixels on the screen and yeah. do all this work. It's very complicated technology. Uh, surely, the 90 to 95 percent of the CPU time will be spent in the graphics. <laughs> and, you know, we were lucky. And, and I think they were at in software, I think, in Quake or Doom or something like that. That probably is true. But at Looking Glass, because we had these game programmers and designers who were really pushing games, not pushing graphics, um, yeah. you know, it was probably, I don't know actual numbers, but it was probably 60% or 50% even was oh. of the CPU time was going to the graphics. Um, you know, so it, it, uh, it hampered my ability yes. to, to be a graphics powerhouse <laughs> of the Carmack flavor. But that's okay, because I liked those games more anyway. Uh, even though I didn't contribute to the design of them, I was glad to help those people achieve their goal uh, with creating these uh, wonderful games. Fair enough. Um, so, uh, how, where did that whole tangent come from? Uh, we were talking about, oh, what the graphics is like. So, yes. yes. <laughs> um, so, this whole thing is software rendered, so there's no graphics processor. Well, I mean, this uh, video that you're playing, who knows, they, that this could be, because Thief 2 uh, did get ported to GPUs, and System Shock 2 was uh, GPU only, if I recall correctly. I see. Um, but, uh, so it's all software rendered, and so the software has to solve a whole bunch of problems. Um, you know, with uh, graphics, if you've ever done any 3D graphics programming, you're, uh, you'll be familiar with the Z buffer, uh, which automatically resolves hidden surfaces. When one surface is in front of another, it, it stores the coordinates that the pixels are at and uses that to resolve which pixel is closer. Yeah. And we didn't, we, we couldn't afford to do that in software. The extra computation and oh, the yeah. extra memory usage and cache of storing a Z buffer was problematic. Uh, and so, for example, this thing has to determine hidden surfaces, uh, it, it, try to determine which surfaces are probably hidden and not draw them at all, and then you know draw the remaining ones back to front. It's an old That's classic true. And you also technique. have you had to reduce overdraw, right? I know Quake yeah, reduced so, overdraw by using a spam buffering like edge list technique. What it used that was how that was how Quake did it with was basically spam buffering, although it's sort of a higher level thing. Um, and in this, we used uh, what we, uh, a guy named Seth Teller had a uh, thesis that was about something called portals and cells, nothing to do with the uh, portals in half uh, Valve's game. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but uh, this idea that, um, uh, you know, if you want to draw a mirror, you uh, reflect the camera around and redraw the scene from the other side. It's sort of like that mirror is sort of a portal into a reversed world. And so the way a portal-based renderer works is at, at the boundary, all, you know, on the screen that uh, I'm looking at now, um, there's, you know, a, a 
some stairs and a door. Yeah. And just lots of lots of in and out. In, in in this volume, there are lots of invisible portals chopping the whole space up into convex pieces, um, and then it's tracking the visibility through the portals, and it draws back to front so that if there are, you a pixel is drawn more than once, it appears correctly. But to minimize that overdraw, it, it clips all the polygons against the portals that they're visible through, so it doesn't draw the polygons it, uh, approximately. It, it, it's too expensive to actually clip them to the portal, so it right. uses a it clips them to an, a, a bounding approximation to the portals. So you know, there's just tons of stuff like that. There's how the optimized inner loop, you know, it, for pushing out the individual pixels works, and you know, these were much slower machines back then. So you know the uh, there was no bilinear filtering like Casey has done for Handmade Hero. There's, uh, you know, the, the inner loops of these are very simple. They're just trying to grab a, a pixel from a texture map and light it and push it to the screen as fast as it can. But speaking of texture mapping, like what did you use any sort of effects, texture mapping effects for? Uh, in software rendering, there's like no time to do anything. So, um, you know, the, <laughs> right. yeah, the, the, the basic idea with Quake here is that it's light mapped. So, um, there's you know a texture representing the material, and then there's a differently scaled texture representing the light playing across a given wall. And rather than in the inner loop, it tries to combine them. It actually combines them in something called a surface cache, where it pre-bakes uh, a final texture that's already been lit, yeah. and which is unique for everything in the world. So all of these things are actually drawing from unique textures, and it just keeps a cache of what you can currently see pre-lit. And that was a technique from Quake. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Well, yeah, looking at the clip, it's fascinating. Although I'm going to try and go back to, to our faces just <laughs> so people can uh, see us again. All right. Awesome. Um, so how was, you know, again, I want to get like your thoughts on that experience of you developing that software uh, render for the graphics. Like, was it a good experience? Um, would you do it again uh, as extensively as you did back then? Um, um, well, it, it doesn't have that much to do with programming. So, right. The first project I worked on at Looking Glass uh, was called Terra Nova, and I think we had, I don't know, somewhere from three to six programmers. Uh, System Shock 1, which I didn't really work on, was like two or four programmers. Um, and then Thief, I, I can't honestly remember how many programmers it was, but Thief 3, which we didn't, there was a different Thief 3, the actual released one, but Looking Glass started a Thief 3 before it shut down. And we had an engine team. So we were just making the engine. It had nothing to, like, game programs would have been separate. And that engine team was, there were two graphics people. So I want to say it was somewhere between six and eight people on that engine. Oh. Uh, and... Um, I, I kind of had an interesting history with Looking Glass because I was a little bit frustrated with its uh, inability to, uh, what I felt like was management's inability to stay focused on what we were good at. Um, we, you know, there, was, there were some oddball games that we did, like uh, there was a golf game that Looking Glass made. Um, <laughs> nice. And, uh, and so I actually quit Looking Glass in frustration uh, twice. <laughs> So I actually was hired at Looking Glass three times because I quit, got rehired, and then quit and got rehired. Uh, and one of those times, I quit literally so I could do graphics research. I was like, they could not find time for me to actually do research. And so I quit, did research for three months, came back, and I said, here's the stuff I've done. And that was the starting point for the Thief 3 engine. Um, <laughs> And, you know, so I just did the work on my own dime. It was like, but that was the only way I was going to get to do it. So, um, so there was that corporate restri restriction, and then there was the like team interaction. And so the third time that the the second time they rehired me, so the third time I was there, uh, I was like, I need an office because we all worked in open pits. And I was like, I, you know, this time around, I'm just uh, I'm going to work eight hour days, and I want an office. Um, and so they gave me that, um, and that like cut me off from some of the. The, you know the overhead of the the team inefficiencies. Uh, I really liked working in the open pits because it, you were more collaborative. You shared ideas more rapidly. You overheard other people talking about stuff that you might have an interesting thing to say that they would never have brought it up in front of you. On the other hand, you know, hearing lots of irrelevant stuff distracting you. You know, that's a whole debate. I don't want to get yeah, into. Yeah. But my point about all that is that. Um, after I did that, had that experience, that's the only uh, large, quote unquote, large team. And uh, modern game development, large team is, you know, 10 to 50 times as large or whatever. Um, that was the largest that I got at uh, because the startup I worked at before that was even small. And I kind of was soloing most of my projects on the 
startup. Yes. So uh, the printer startup. So uh, when, then I went indie for seven years. And so I was just programming by myself. And I was like, you know what? I work way better when I'm just programming by myself because <laughs> I get to use my own coding style. I don't have to you know, interact with other people's designs. I mean, these are all things everyone has to deal with. Absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, except John Carmack, because he can let's say, you know, everyone has to do it, Whatever it center, is. build it around me yes. and make him efficient, which, you know, awesome. It was great, great that he found that environment where he was able to do that. Totally a uh, success story, you know, totally replicate that if you can. But, um, <laughs> but I couldn't. And uh, so I had been working by myself at that point for so long. I could, uh, when I decided to go back uh, and get a job in, in 2008, uh, Rad, is a company where I get to own the code. It's my project. I have total control over it. Um, I have uh, you know, one guy, uh, Fabian, uh, rigorous on Who's Twitter. Who's here, by the way. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, who is here. Um, you know, contributed to it significantly, uh, but it's my product. And and he had to just make do and work in my style. He he works on multiple products and he switches his indentation style as needed, you know. Um, so, um, Rad gave me that opportunity to keep working as a solo programmer and not deal with the team stuff. And I just couldn't picture doing the team stuff anymore. I felt like it's not like it's not that bad if I only work at half speed because I'm working on a team. It's not the greatest thing, but you know, but you put four of me together in a group, and if each of us works at fifty percent, that might be pretty good. Yes. Um, if if you put me together with three weaker programmers and you cut my productivity in half, that doesn't feel very good. Like, it, it, is that actually? A net improvement. But the biggest problem, even with its four of me, is that I, I just feel better working at 100% than I feel working at 50%. It's bad for my morale. And so I couldn't picture going back into the industry and facing a large team. I would think I would be okay on a team of two to four, um, but there aren't lots of opportunities like that. So, um, so what was the question? You were talking about, <laughs> you had asked about... Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we went from technical questions to back again to uh, how you feel about things. But I think I'm just trying to tie up the first half. Oh, right. You were, you were talking. Wait, was this all an answer to that? You, the young people question? <laughs> yes. yes. OK. <laughs> so um, uh, boy, I can't remember how this connects to the young people question, but clearly it did. Um, it did. What, was the actual, what was the actual question about the young people? Uh, it, am I surprised? What was the? Yeah, back with the wait. young people, it was like, uh, we were talking about, before we cut off the stream, we were talking about how you felt about, uh, oh yeah, how you felt about software being pushed as this overloaded oh. kind of thing, and then you sort of gave examples yeah. Yeah, of, yeah. of why that's the case, probably, potentially. Well, that was an earlier question too, though. That, yes, and was. you were kind of trying to, you were trying to hit it from a different angle, I think, and it kind of, I kind of just turned it back to the same question. Exactly. But, um, <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, this whole question is just like a combination of things that I don't really know and understand and don't have exposure to because I've stayed away from team programming. So, uh, you know, one, one point here is that whole like stitching together frameworks and libraries yes, and stuff yes. like that is actually a topic that has come up again and again in the past. So there's the classic um, No Silver Bullet uh, uh, essay by the name escapes me offhand. Um, and I'm sure chat will say. I'm sure the chat, yeah. yeah. Um, and... I think it was a, a follow-up 10 years later or something, uh, but it might be in the original, where he talked about the idea that usable, com reusable components uh, was a way to step around the, the no silver bullet issue. So the new, I don't want to go too far into this, but the no silver bullet issue is just, he, he predicted that there would be no revolution in programming. There would, nobody would come along and say, I found a new way of improving pro programming. We are now 10 times faster or 10 uh, times better or whatever. There was, there was never going to be a silver bullet. You know, nobody's going to invent a new language that really changes things that dramatically. And w so w this, I think it was an addendum 10 years later, he was like, maybe reusable components is going to be the mechanism by which we get 10x better. And I think it is how, what has let us produce 10 times as many programs in some <laughs> sense. Yes. Um, because now you can just stitch stuff together. But that's the, so what I was going to say is the no silver bullet article, uh, you know, rigorous will know uh, was I don't know the '60s or '70s. I I don't remember. Um, so the follow up was in the '80s, maybe. I'm it's just totally guessing here, but it's it's plausible that he would have said this in the '80s. So we were already talking about reusable components in the '80s. It was a thing that we could see as possibly a good idea. Um, and even you know that uh, that printer software company, my roommate who worked there, um, he left early when he saw it was before it quite failed, and he went to a company where. 
I let's see if I can remember this. Yeah. The way he explained it to me was that they took Visual Basic and stitched together an OCR, you know, optical character recognition, yes. an out of the box. They just got an out of the box DLL from somebody and they stitched that together with VB6 to something else and sold it at massive profits. Mm. And he just made it sound like it was the most trivial, dumb, stupid programming ever. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, the company that I was at was making this really sophisticated postscript interpreter, graphics, blah, 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 very hard technical challenge and was struggling to stay afloat. And, you know, he jumped ship and went to this company where he made easy money stitching components together. So, uh, yeah, that, and that was, that was in the 90s. Um, and so, like, I, I already saw that coming in some sense. Like, not, none of that was a surprise. Um, and that it is a messy solution that causes lots of problems is not surprising to me either. But but I've stayed away from that space, so I, I can't. I don't have a very informed opinion about it. All right. And uh, will you ever go back to that space? Like I'm not. I'm not sure what you're planning to do in the next ten years, for example. Well, that that space is a. It's not something I can go back to because I was talking about the space of plugging shit together, <laughs> um, or or equivalently JavaScript frameworks. And JavaScript, <laughs> Angular that, JS. <laughs> oh God. I wanted to. I wanted to say. I. I. This is a total tangent, but I was trying to work this in earlier, and I. I never found the right spot for it. Um, you know, I was talking about how glorious it was back on those eight-bit computers where everything ran at sixty frames per second, and you could boot it and immediately start programming. Yes. Um. Yes. So. So save that thought now for the thing I'm about to say, which is there has been some discussion in some quarters, not talking about handmade, just in general, where people are talking about programming and people like me, you know, people of the same mindset are a little bit worried about, we were, let's say before handmade happened. Yes. Um, we're a little bit worried about what the new generation of people encountering computers were experiencing because they have these closed mobile devices that they can't program on. Um, they right. have languages like JavaScript, which are like, eh, it's not the end of the world, but you know, it's not like PHP. JavaScript is not like that bad, but it like, doesn't feel, there's a lot of stuff in JavaScript that doesn't feel right. And so it was really kind of easy to look at that and go, oh, these guys are just fucked because they're just having the wrong set of experiences coming into this. They're never, they're going to be terrible programmers because they're going to have been educated wrong and they're working with all these shitty things. Yes. <laughs> To be, to be fair, though, any of us who were saying that, that was total bullshit because we started on BASIC, which is the worst fucking language ever also. <laughs> so if we survived BASIC and turned into the programmers we are, we have no excuse to be talking shit about people learning from JavaScript or PHP, you know, whatever. Learning from it. You obviously should not stay programming it. Uh, but yeah, you know, that's not going to rot your mind. Or the, the other one is Java. Everyone learning Java in university. Uh, Everyone's like, oh my God, they're learning this object oriented stuff. They're yeah, just ruined. Yeah. And it's like, no, you're not ruined. If we could survive basic, you guys can survive Java. Okay. And the, okay. So that was my little, that was my little tangent. <laughs> I was trying to work in earlier and I had forgotten about. So now let's pop that back to what we were just talking about, yeah. which was, we were just taking off the reasonable component stuff. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, oh yeah. And so you would ask, well, what do I see myself doing? So I was saying, I, I'm never going to be stitching together reusable components, clearly. Um, I have no clue. Um, I expect to get back into games. The thing is, I'm really a technologist. Like, that's my strong suit. Um, I enjoy game design and, and level design in some sense. Um, and, you know, in an ideal world, I would retire and just make video games without trying to make money from them. But yeah, I'm not quite at that point yet. Um, but I would, I hope... Um, you know, as long as my mind is functional, uh, I hope and expect I will still be programming. Um, based on the current arc, I don't see myself stopping doing libraries um, because uh, so we haven't talked about the STB libraries really. Um, so I maybe we should segue to that. Um, I, and I don't know if you have specific questions, but so what I was going to just say there is that one of the many, as I said, there or maybe this was in the stream that got cut off, but there are many reasons that I made the SDB libraries. Um, yeah, many I things that led to them. Upon that, so if you want to touch upon it, yeah. Many things that led to them being structured the way they are, being public domain, being all those things. And you know, I, I gave the one example. We did get through that, right? Of the the library I made at yes, Looking Glass. Yeah, 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 I did talk about that. So. Um, uh, the, one of the things, though, is I make these libraries for myself. I make them because um, 
I want to package this functionality in a way that I can reuse 10 years from now when I don't remember how this stuff works. So I want it to be easy to use. You know, it's the same as like writing comments for yourself or all those other things. You, the future you doesn't remember anything you know. Yeah. So one of the things that I do, not always, not 100% of the libraries, but most of the libraries I make are actually for me. I make them reusable. I don't need them to be re reusable right now, but I make them reusable now so I can reuse them in the future. And so I do expect till the day I die, as long as my mind is functioning, I will still be making STB libraries because it's the way I've you know, found to do it. I mean, I, I guess if I know I only have a year to live, maybe at that point I don't worry about reuse um, because I'm not going to be reusing them, but yeah, yeah. who knows? Okay. Well, you know, with that, uh, I'm going to try and start driving the conversation to the questions because I've received almost dozens of questions for you. All right. I'll have to pick some. some. Because we, we haven't talked about the STB stuff really at all. But yeah. if everyone knows yeah. about it, because they've, you know, Casey's yeah. talked about plenty on Handmade Heroes. So if everyone knows about it, that's fine. There's no reason to go into it. All right, yeah. And, yeah, and if anybody has a question about STB, just feel free to ask it, and I'm sure uh, Sean will address it. Um, so I think this comes from... Uh, Actually, before that, I'm sorry, guys. Keep asking questions. I'm compiling the list of questions. I do have one last thing for Sean, um, and that has to be with Handmade Dev. And um, you've seen some of the programs that have come out of it. Uh, one of them, like the stack's not even released yet, but you've already seen, for example, Four Coder by mm -hmm. Alan Webster, or you've seen the project of Handmade Quake um, already yep. uh, in production. And, you know, uh, actually, this does tie into the question, to the first question we've gotten, and it's saying, this is from Maxwell Perman. Uh, Sean, we did not have remotely the same working conditions or amount of experience yet for us to recognize this handmade mindset as the right way to program, right? So I, I don't know what you think. Like if we have these, if we have this community that's pushing out educational materials like Handmade Quake, or we have this community that's pushing out uh, interesting, performant, useful products like for a coder out the door, um, and people recognize that as a good thing, like, won't that create a space where we don't ever have to think about that somebody has to program in Java? Like, do you believe a future where these languages can absolutely be eradicated? Um, or do you not? Do you just not even care? Or do you think that's not even going to happen? Well, I think... Um... I, uh, I mean, I think the problem is that the space of software, like as we were talking about, like what are the forces that led to this situation, and which is a, a bit of a mystery. I mean, it's not, a, it's not probably not a mystery. I'm sure there's people who are confident they have the answer, and they're probably right. Um, but you know, we talked about like the proliferation of software, just how much software there is out there, exactly. and yes. you know, and um, I, it feels to me like no, like the handmade thing is like people who want a certain kind of quality. Um, and not everyone does. Like you're, you're. Yeah. So I mean, um, yeah. You take the the mythical, hypothetical Sean Barrett, who is the god awful, awesome, not awful, <laughs> god awesome programmer who everyone <laughs> says he is. You know, who is ten times better than any other programmer. Let's right. just hypothetical one. I, I, I'm not That's joking. True. I'm not joking. I'm just saying. Let's hypothetically <laughs> so suppose okay. that guy exists. Okay. And you team him up with three other guys who are 10 times worse, and you drop his productivity by 50%, clearly he is now delivering, the total group is now delivering less code, quality code, than he was by himself. That, that mystical, hypothetical 10x John. Um, right, because he's at now only at 5x them, and 5 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 8. So you would have been better off not adding the three people to the team. Okay, that's the, that's the fantasy. Yes, yes. Um, so the, there's a there's a handmade fantasy, which I'm not saying anyone in the handmade world actually believes, but I just want to like call this out explicitly, which is you know you put a really good programmer who understands this stuff on it by himself, you know, tiny team, whatever, so they don't ruin their productivity, yeah. and you can get the software out. And could we just educate everyone to be that guy? Um, and I I assume the answer is no. I don't know why. I don't know the details. I haven't thought about it at all. But it seems like no. Yeah, that's just not the nature of the world. You can get those isolated programs. We can get some people doing this, but it doesn't sound right to me that you'd get the entire world into that mindset. Okay. Um, and they and they'd all need to be 10x programmers anyway. So, <laughs> um, so you've got to compromise. You've got to have teams of 50 people. You've got to have software practices that work with teams of 50 people. And I think 
Um, it is unclear that there is the handmade uh, that the handmade philosophy works on teams of fifty programmers. I am. Yeah, there are definitely cases where you know you can divide up the project cleanly enough that everyone just works in their own thing. You know, maybe there are success stories. I don't know anything about how NASA programming is. You know, maybe <laughs> it, it can be done. But my intuition is that no, like that's going to proceed in isolation. You're going to have people who can do this stuff, um, and most people are never going to be doing that. And and. Uh, sorry. So the reason I went there is because I was talking about that, like uh, who wants the quality, right? Normally you're trading off, you're trading off, you know, fast, choose three, cheap, fast, good, whatever the things are. And, um, and the idea there is that the 10 X program maybe steps out. Maybe the 10 X program can step outside that curve and just make something that's all three because he's 10 X, but there's only so many 10 X programs to go around, even assuming the fantasy is true. And, uh, the rest of, uh, of us are stuck with cheap, fast, good. And so the handmade <laughs> philosophy uh, may not uh, be um, adaptable to situations where you have to compromise on one of those three things. So it seems uh, after talking to you and, and Casey Mortori and other people that I'm, I'm inclined to agree myself. So I think handmade dev is more about creating a community where, it's, uh, where we're legitimizing our approach to programming against a proliferating software community where they don't appreciate this. And we can just gather around and push our quality software out the door. But we're not pretending that we're going to be able to convert everybody <laughs> to, to program in this yes. way, which is what I think you're getting at. Um, and I, I must agree, even NASA, which I think most of them there do a great job at launching rockets, <laughs> for example, um, they come out, they come out there with, out of their own accord and they already have that kind of natural affinity towards low-level sure. programming. So yeah, I see that. All right, I'm not sure, Josh. Well, wait, so what's the question that you were answering the, uh, what is the right approach to getting into the handmade mindset? Yes. Was that the, that the question? Because that's actually a little bit of a different question. I see. Uh, because that's a question of like, how do you as an individual, like, so uh, that, I, it's an interesting question to me because it's something I touched on in my talk, which is that um, you, if you think of handmade uh, as a reaction, you, like you, you realize there's something wrong with the other stuff and you like find this new way. Um, I. Uh, the argument that I made in my other talk was that um, I can't, uh, I don't think that's a thing you can teach exactly in the sense of this is a bad way to do things, not not handmade, but the, uh, the existing approach is bad. Um, use this other thing. I don't think that's a, as an evangelical method going to be very successful. Okay. And, and what I argued there was just that what I hope is that by calling attention to the fact that I like had this transformative experience, let us say, uh, in which... Um, you know, after encountering certain bad things, I like enough times, I eventually realized this is bad. Let me do it a different way. The idea that I'm proposing is that we shorten that cycle so that people maybe only have to encounter it once. And then they go, wait, that's what this guy was talking about. Let's go try doing it this other way he was talking about. So they stop and maybe have the bad experience, encounter whatever it is that, that promotes that thing, the terrible software or whatever. But with with that one experience, you know, they can, they get there instead of them having to get there themselves after a lot of bad experiences. That's my theory. Yeah. Oh, huh. it's fascinating. And, you know, with that, I think we're already officially in the Q&A. So <laughs> can, uh, are you OK with that? Let's do the q &A. Oh, yeah. No, I, I am happy to keep going. All right. So we have uh, if you have any questions, just make sure you, you spit them out there in the chat and I will uh, try to get them to Sean. So the next question comes from. Uh, FFSJS, Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> Sean, what can we do to have you doing more streaming? Uh, oh. <laughs> I for sure, and probably many other people would enjoy you walking us through your code. So. Well, uh, so uh, primarily this is talking about OBBG, uh, so. which is another product we didn't talk about, or a project. Not. Yeah, product. you can talk about it um, a little bit if you want. And in fact, I wouldn't even call OBBG walking people through my code. I would talk, call it, you know, live coding in the traditional set. Like I'm inventing the solutions and struggling with them and worrying about them, which I think is very different from like, oh, I'm going to show you how I have some code here. Let me show you how it works. And so I just want to make it explicit that that's the question I'm answering here. Yeah. Um, uh, the answer is there's nothing you can do. Um, I, I'm still <laughs> intending to work on it. Um, I just, um, you know, yes. I, I did a little, uh, I did a little interview for a, a site called the setup, um, uh, uses this.com, which is just a text interview. And where, where when I tried to give my bio, I realized that, 
um, the STB stuff falls at the bottom of a very long list of priorities. You know, I have um, I even working on music is actually a higher priority for me than the STB libraries. And OBBG is somewhere around the STBB libraries, STB libraries currently in my priority list. Um, and so it just doesn't rise to the top uh, quite often enough. Now, one thing that happened is I had developed a cough uh, last year. Oh. I stuck around for six months and I didn't really want to try to stream while that was going on. And that kind of got me out of the habit. Uh, and then I was going to try to start uh, right around the new year and I got a cough that stuck with me for six weeks. Uh, so I couldn't start when I had intended to. But I do plan to try to get back on that relatively soon. Uh, the other kind of streaming that I do besides OBBG is doing STB stuff. I would like to do uh, an STB library from scratch on oh, stream, but yes, I haven't please. I haven't had a library from scratch in a while, except like this, I, I got this idea back before I did STB voxel render, but I really wanted to do the STB voxel render trailer, uh, so I couldn't live stream the development oh. of it because that I didn't want to spoil it because the whole point of that trailer was to release on April 1st when people wouldn't know whether it was an April Fool's joke or not. So, um, and I haven't done a new library since then, so uh, I'm keeping my eye out for that. I would like to do one of those full-on stream. That's why I started OBPG, really, was because I didn't have an STB library to do on stream, and I was like, let me do something from scratch on stream. Um, I also, once in a while, do STB maintenance on stream, but it's not very interesting, so I haven't bothered. If people really are interested in STB maintenance on stream, I'd be happy to do it, though. Uh, but it doesn't seem that useful to me. Okay. Uh, if you guys uh, want Sean to stream tomorrow... I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> But I would love to, you know, I'm, a, I'm your moderator and I'll go to every single one. Um, anyway, the next question comes from the one and only Alan Webster, who's developing for Coder, actually. Um, he's asking you, um, if you prefer to work alone, Sean, why does your sense, I guess your aesthetic sense of API library design work so well? Okay, yeah, so... Um... Oh, I, I get it. Because you're not on a team, so you don't understand how yeah. people are going to use it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It makes sense. Um, so, um, I, so there's a couple things here, right? Well, so one is that, uh, I, like I said, I'm designing the code to be reused by me, um, and this actually gets. And this actually gets at uh, one of the origin stories for the STB libraries. As I said, there are multiple, mm -hmm. and they're and they're all true. They just it's all the fact to mind. So one of the biggest motivations um, was that the uh, PNG library, libpng, um, has a terrible API. Um, yeah, there's I'm also sorry. there's also a JPEG that was much earlier library, and the PNG guys. One of the things that JPEG has is that if it runs out of memory or, or runs into some failed problem, it does something called uh, long jump, which is basically uh, C++ exceptions in C, sort of. So it just yeah. jumps out of where it is and goes all the way out. And they require you to write the exception handler around it. Uh, that's part of the API, which is just insane. Nobody ever has done this. Like you have to, when you call the JPEG library, you have to wrap it in a set jump uh, so that they can long jump. It's it's insane. It could easily live inside their API at the top level. They just they didn't do it that way. I don't know why. So uh, libpng copied that same API design of having this exposed long jump set jump thing that you have to put in your code. Um, and because they uh, people working in Unix, they are all of their libraries live in standard locations. All their headers live in standard locations. And so. Uh, PNG uses a, a compression library called Zlib internally. And uh, for some reason, they make their public header file for libpng include the public header file for the Zlib compressor, even though you as a user don't need Zlib at all. Um, and so when you're on Windows and these things don't have standard locations, it means whenever you want to use PNG, uh, you need the DLL and the lib, oh, and you yeah. need the PNG yeah. header, and you need the Zlib header, and I think one of those might have more than one header. Yes. So you need all of these files. And I was like, that's just not right. Like, that's that's not the API design, that's the, the infrastructure, the build system design. And I was like, that's just not right. And so I would always have these wrappers for JPEG and PNG that did the set jump, long jump, and the, the APIs for, the, for them were very complicated because they wanted to handle the case that you're uh, progressively loading. You know, you're, it's coming down a network and you're yes. partially decoding the image as it comes down. Very important for browsers, they actually need it, and I don't care about it at all for STB image. So I was like, I'm going to make a much simpler API and do this. So I already had wrappers to do this, and I would have to carry the wrappers and all the files around all the time. And I was like, I'm just like, this is, you know, tiresome. Um, 
And then the, finally, the main thing was that I'd always, you know, I talked about, I read these bite magazines. I was always, always interested in the technology. Uh, in college, I kept, even though I was doing this tech stuff, I kept following the graphics re research and stuff. But anyway, uh, so I knew about JPEG. I knew how it worked. I'd read, you know, a Dr. Dobbs article about the idea. And yes. I'd always been curious to write a JPEG decompressor, but the spec was not publicly available. It was an ITU spec or whatever. And you had to pay, I don't know, $100 to get it. Um, and, you know, this was pre-internet being that, com you know, widespread or whatever. Right. But even once the internet was coming along, they didn't make those publicly available. So one day, fateful day, I noticed that uh, W3C, the w World Wide Web Consortium, you know, they have the HTML specification. And one of the things HTML can include is JPEG files. And so they had put the JPEG spec online for free. So I downloaded it and I implemented it. And so one weekend, <laughs> one weekend, I, I took the JPEG spec and I just sat there and I wrote code and that took me a day. And I was like, okay, like, let me wrap that up nicely. Okay, now instead of having to carry around a DLL, a lib, multiple headers, um, well, it was only one header for JPEG. So three files, instead of having to carry around three files, I can just have this one file uh, that I carry around that can do the JPEG decoding for me. And then I was like, well, you know, as long as I've done this, let me spend the rest of this weekend and I'll write a PNG decoder and put that into the same library. And so I had this one uh, header file library that I wrote in a weekend that could do both JPEGs and PNGs, one file instead of the three files for JPEG and five plus files for PNG. And again, on Unix, this all was fine. Nobody ever yes. saw the three files and the five files. They just lived in the right places and just worked. But in Unix, there's like no, uh, in Windows, there's just no standard directory where any of these things live. Whenever I move to a new machine, I would like, oh, maybe I'll try creating a lib directory where everything lives all the time. And I never got it right. And it never worked. And it was just a mess. And I was like, if I just make one file for myself, I my life will be happy. It will be happy, yes. So, all right. So that part of the answer uh, to his <laughs> question is, this is all for me. Like, I was making everything that I could easier for me. And that includes the API design. And so I, I want the API to just do the simplest thing. Now, I have to, when I design the API, think about other people's uses. So it's not quite that trivial. Um, so, other, so the other half of that question is other people. You can work in a team where your team is like, we have split this product up into four executables and there are four of us. So each of us is going to work on an executable and we're just going to communicate some other mechanism through the executables and we all write our own code in our own style. You can do that project and it can be great. Uh, you have to pick something that divides up well. You have to communicate well what the API is between those executables. True. So I'm not opposed to that kind of scenario at all. Like I would be totally comfortable working in that environment. With, I could work in that environment with a team of 100 people if I only had to interact with two other people's executables and I got to control over my executable, it wouldn't matter that there were 100 people. You need some architect there who understands the whole system. Right, like, exactly. You can't really go that way. But, you know, the, you know, the whole, uh, the big company as a services kind of model goes in this direction. They split their product up into all these small services and the services communicate on the, their local networks. Mm -hmm. um, it is a technique that people are using to try to solve this problem of not having the giant team working on a single product. So, um, so I'm sensitive to those things. Um, I'm not opposed to working with other people. Um, I'm just opposed to the morale boost, I t the morale loss I take from working with too many other people or, or working with people who aren't as, at least as efficient as I am or around as efficient as I am or whatever. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I guess that covers it. I mean, yes. I, there's, there's more subtle details, but whatever. Yeah, yeah. Something uh, I liked what, from what you said about the the libpng and these other libraries uh how the infrastructure was part of the way that you had to use it you have to mess with the infrastructure i'm sorry it reminds me of the time i was trying to do this talk called so, oh, what programming is never about I mean, to initially, um, yes, and which i'm actually playing right now for the, for for the stream real quick the, um right? yeah so, so i was oh, messing with the build system i'm a you know i grew up with linux like month, so whenever i would build projects i would just use the Linux terminal for that uh, the, there you can see the video now. Two, um, and I was struggling a lot um, to try to get my project, which was a text okay. editor project, to build with I mean, SDL window, on Windows. And I'm sure many people have fainted right now because of that, my what I just said. Um, <laughs> And I spent like 20 minutes, was it, Charm? Because I think you were there, here, but I had um, to trying to get this build system to work. I, I and I just couldn't make it happen. Like and once I did yes. realize what was going on, then I, you know, my yeah. time was lost there. And then after Probably that, you made a talk in response to sort of how to make a build system more automated, yeah. right? Um, yep. 
and then pop so in. when did you first realize that you that common. you have to wrangle this build system and get it under control for your projects like when did that happen when, did it happen once you were dealing with the thief project or was it much earlier in your life yeah. well you just run build and let's see what now, I started with, you know, until I got to Looking Glass, I was doing Unix hmm. programming, uh, and it was really never much of an issue. You made your make file. I, I was only making small projects, you know, that, that it was never really much of an issue. Yeah. One of the things that I ran into Looking Glass that was an influence on the STB libraries as well was uh, we had a shared technology group that made libraries that all the games could use. You know, this was software rendering days. So when you wrote a texture mapper, the texture mapper wasn't very game specific. You could write a texture mapper and just reuse it on all the games. So we had this reusable library core. Yes. And and I and not a knock on what those guys did. It was awesome. It was great for what it you know was intended to do. It it exactly was awesome for that. But what it was not intended to do, well, sorry, let me be explicit. What it was intended to do was be used in large video games. Now, of course, a large video game at the time we were doing this was 120k lines of code rather than the million or whatever that people are talking about nowadays. Um but one of the things this meant, and it's a, an issue that we've, uh, that, you know, I don't, Casey may have talked about, uh, because I don't follow Handmade Hero myself, um, is uh, this idea that um, the, the API design uh, changes when, uh, based on your assumption about the scope of the, the needs of the API change depending on the scope of what the project that's being used in. And so uh, that's the abstract philosophical statement. Let me yeah, be explicit. Yeah. When you're making a large video game and you need to use this library, it's okay that it takes you half a day to hook up the library in some sense because that time is amortized over this large project that you're working on. Sure. Um, when you want to make a quick and dirty tool in an hour to get some little thing done. I want to visualize this thing or whatever. Yes. <laughs> and the libraries that you're working with expect you to be writing a full-scale video game. Those assumptions can easily mismatch what you're trying to do. It's too hard to integrate. They assume you have all this other stuff set up that you don't have set up, you know, etc. And so when I was at Looking Glass, I ran into this problem. I would want to make these little tools and I would find that the libraries that we had just couldn't be used reasonably for the task I was doing because they were too much work to integrate or, you know, just uh, require, uh, assumed too many um, pre-existing, uh, you know, environment things that I didn't have in the quick and dirty tools. Uh, and I've already forgotten the question. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, your experience, but, uh, yeah, your experience with, when did you start automating this build system? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So, so, so even there, I could use the Looking Glass build system to build these little projects. I probably didn't though, I don't remember. Um, but I saw that that problem of, of uh, systems not being designed to, to be incorporated easily, saw the friction due to that. And that was when I learned that lesson of like, you want to minimize the friction um, if for nothing else, because small projects, it cannot use it if the friction isn't minimized because it's just too much time to be worth the effort. Um, and uh, it wasn't specifically build system at Looking Glass, but it, like that was where I saw that issue arise. And so then, um, but at Looking Glass, I was on DOS and Windows and, and that's where you encounter the, when you start trying to use third-party libraries, you discover, you know, there's just this whole split uh, in the world, at least there was, 10 or 15 years ago between the Windows and Unix. And you could see this all the time when academic projects would come out, you know, we talked about this a little bit, that, yeah. you know, have some weird license or whatever, but you, they would release and they would almost always only be buildable in Unix. You could just only use them from Unix at all, like in the what was released. And if you needed to use them from Windows, you had to figure it all out from scratch. You had to fix all their assumptions about Unix. And it makes perfect sense because that's the environment those guys were using. Right. But it's clearly... <coughs> It's not a user-centric design. And so, um, I, again, you know, the user-centric design of the STB libraries comes from the fact that I want to use them myself. Um, it is the starting point. Once people started using them, you know, I had to kind of take a second look and like make sure I was really serving those people well, which is just the thing I was saying about, before about don't be lazy. Once you have other people, once you really want other people to use your code, you have to spend the time to make it usable by them. Uh, otherwise, you're just wasting everyone's time. And I don't want to waste everyone's time. So I do that work. Fantastic. Fantastic. And then let's go to the next question. Actually, I'm on my last wine glass. I'm not sure if you're drinking yourself. Oh, you are. <laughs> All right. <laughs> 
Cheers, this is awesome. So the next question comes from Kieber Caleb. Um, he's asking, are there any, uh-oh, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. You know, I, I block off and I censor all languages from the chat, like C++, C, so you can't really see it just because I want to avoid language wars. Um, yeah. I think he means C++. Are there, <laughs> are there any C++ features that you feel like you are missing out on because you stick to pure C? Well, I, I think I've probably talked about this at length. And, you know, my opinion at this point is a little dated in that, you know, I last used C++ seriously at Looking Glass. So I, I don't remember exactly how I stopped. I don't remember the timing of that. But, you know, so that 2001-ish, um, the, the, the two towers fell and I stopped using C++. Um, <laughs> is that too soon? Sorry. Yeah. Um, so... Um, so I, I'm not exposed to the modern features. Um, I'm stuck using an old C compiler that predates C99, so I don't even get declare anywhere. Um, so you have to and like declare all your variables at the beginning? You have I have to? to declare all my variables at the beginning of a scope. I occasionally just insert dummy scopes so that I can declare a new variable somewhere. <laughs> However, I'm, I'm of two minds about this. I actually wrote a long rant about this and deleted it off my website because I... As, as the times changed, it was no longer interesting to argue it. Um, there is a value to the fact that all declarations have to appear in a particular place so that when you're looking at a piece of code and you're wondering what type is this variable, you can glance up and there is a particular spot where that variable must be declared. I mean, a couple spots because of multiple scopes. But yeah. whereas with declare anywhere, it could be anywhere in the function. Um, now people reply, well, the smart editor, you just mouse over it or hover over it or whatever, and it shows you what type it is. And I'm like, I'm looking at GitHub in, in a web browser. Like, I don't get that feature. Um, You're right. So, yeah, and, that, and that's kind of an edge case. I, I always make that argument, but obviously that argument is a little bit of an edge case because we do spend 95% of our time or 99% of our time looking at code in, a, in an editor. I, I dislike anything where you require editor smarts for a system to work well. Um, but that's probably at this point more me being a curmudgeon than anything to do with it. <laughs> um, so, so declare anywhere is the most obvious feature that I am missing out on, um, but that I'm of two minds about whether it's uh, and it, whether it would be an improvement to have it in my code or not. Um, gotcha. You know, I, I, and, and this gets to like my old argument about syntax highlighting, which is I don't I like almost no syntax highlighting. You know, it possibly if you had declare anywhere and. The, every declaration was highlighted, like the variable where it was declared and nowhere else was highlighted. That might be good because then you could, when you want to scan and find where a variable was declared, you know, you just look for that color and you spot that color and your eye is drawn to that color and you can find it very quickly. So that might be okay. But again, the GitHub doesn't have the syntax coloring. So, you know, the right syntax. Color. So who knows? Um, <laughs> so that's the biggest thing. Um, I think... Uh, you know, there was uh, there was a, a, an interesting article that went by on Twitter where a guy was talking about all the how his coding style has changed. And he's a C plus plus programmer, and he basically is he taught, described all these things he's changed, and it was basically that he was programming C. Um, you know, and he didn't say that, but he just had moved away from inheritance. He had moved away right. from you know, all, all sorts of things. You know, so I'm bringing this up because maybe some people have seen this tweet. Yes. Uh, I, I saw this article. I mean, and uh, what was I saying? Uh, uh, Oh yeah, so um, shoot, there was something in that he mentioned that now I've forgotten. Um, so let me just go. <laughs> sorry, I'm I forgot to find the question out. myself. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about and it. Now I'm discarding it. So uh, I, uh, you know, another one that comes up a lot, I think, is operator overloading. Um, yes. And, yes. And I'll say the same thing that I always say about this. So the philosophy that most people bring to operator overloading is only use it for math because it's too confusing to use, use it, it for, for anything, anything else. else. And and I accept that it's a perfectly valid argument. I'm not. Uh, it's possible that I would succumb to the temptation if I were using C plus plus that I would use operator overlaying for math. But I'm about to tell you why I, why it's excusable. So, gosh, I keep pushing here. But so like a uh, language like Go that doesn't have containers and doesn't have operator overlaying. That's one of the things people can play about. It doesn't have over operator overlaying either for math, like how terrible or whatever. Maybe Go does. I don't even know. But like, it's a common kind of uh, criticism for languages that don't support operator overlaying. And so what, what I'm about to say is really more of a defense for why your language can not have operator overloading and it's still okay. Then it is a criticism of people using 
uh, C++ operator overloading for math. So, and so because the question is like, what am I, how do I feel about C? This is a thing where it's a defense of C as a language that has no operator overloading. Why? I don't think it's that big a deal. And the defense is um, very straightforward. There are many things that we do in programming. We do, many subject matters, our variables represent all sorts of different things. Right. One thing that they can represent is math. Yes. And a bunch of people have said, you know what? It's really convenient if the subject matter you happen to be writing about is math, if you get this special syntax that lets you talk about math in this way that maps more directly to the syntax that mathematicians use. That's correct. But if it's any other subject matter, people are like, yeah, that's fine. You have to write these functions in this grotesque, car complicated way. And so my reaction is, yeah, you, I, math is not, even writing a 3D engine, math is actually not what most of my code is doing. And so the couple places where I'm manipulating vectors and I have to write them in this gnarly syntax doesn't really bother me because it's, as a proportion of the code, not that big a deal. If you, if all you were doing is math, you, you want to use mathematical, you want to use something that literally lets you use the math notation. That is all a sort of a posture, um, that argument. I, I, if you're in C++ and you use operator overlaying for math, uh, you know, fine. It's a little weird because they could be a, a, a 16 by 16 matrix or a complex number. The performance constraints of those are very different. And so from sort of a handmade perspective, it's a little odd. Uh, as a C programmer, one of the things I'm used to is that being very explicit about what the performance thing is going on and operator overlaying can hide that. And that's another reason why I'm kind of, eh, I don't feel like I'm missing out by not having operator overlaying. So the question, the answer to the question of what C++ feature am I missing, that would I, am I giving up by doing this is I've, almost every single one, every single one I can think of, I don't actually find that I'm missing it. But it could all be a post hoc rationalization. Yeah. I don't know. Yes, yes. All right. That was a good, that was a good remark. Good answer. I, I'm sorry if all my answers are long in this no, Q&A. No, no. Everybody's but. enjoying that very much. And we still have 20 minutes left. So we have more than enough time to answer these questions. Um, so a lot of these questions are, are you going to stream again? <laughs> so um, <laughs> he, he already covered that. So let's go to the ones that don't ask that. Um, one question was for me, which was, if you want to take a little break there, one question was for me, and it's, you know, how do you get into the handmade mindset? And all I can say is, have you completed a single project, no matter how small, that requires uh, programming in a way that you understand what's going on behind the scenes? So have you tried a project, you know, in C, um, for example, just an example, have you tried a project in C, uh, even if it's just a snake game, right, or a very, or a Tetris variation, have you completed a project, you know, and seen it through that you feel comfortable showing your peers or showing your friends uh, what you've done, right? Um, once you do that, I think you will understand pretty much everything Sean and I have talked about today, uh, about what it means to sort of be well practiced in this kind of programming in a way where you have to solve problems and not just stitch together these, uh, glue together these uh, frameworks, like I said. Anyway, back to Sean. I'm sorry, I want to give you a really short break. <laughs> um, uh, Sean McGrath, I don't know, do you know Sean McGrath? Yep. All right. Uh, he is the creator of Diet. He's an indie game uh, developer. And he's also done uh, extreme interesting work with uh, M++ and other games, uh, I believe, in other projects. He's asking, uh oh, I lost it. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Sean, where are you? Uh, let me scroll down. Uh, I don't see it, but I, rem I remember. He was asking whether or not you'd be okay with accepting his STB style Vulkan API because he's going to make a Vulkan API uh, STB style anyway. So uh, would you be interested in uh, hearing? or seeing his work and accepting it into the list, I suppose. Uh, that sounds like a question that should be taken off stream, but for the people, <laughs> who, are, the, for the people who are curious, the answer is yes, uh, with some weird asterisks, just because somebody else is also already doing it. But, oh, um, and I, but, found the but, question, I found the question, by the way, I'm sorry, just to say it officially. Okay. Saying, I have a question about STB. Do you want me to do the STB style Vulkan library that I'm going to do anyway? <laughs> so. Yeah. All right, all right, fair enough, taking offline. You, there you go, Sean, message him uh, <laughs> separately. Um, all right, let's keep checking out the questions, Sean. Let me drink my wine real quick here. This one is from Popcorn. Popcorn is asking if you have any wrist or hand problems. And if you do, how do you deal with it or how do you avoid it? 
Uh, I, I don't have a good answer to the last part of that. So um, my story of wrist issues uh, is back when I was working at Looking Glass and I quit for a while. This was back in the days when we had CRTs and CRTs were these big, heavy um, contraptions. Um, and I was living in a tiny, you know, Looking Glass did not pay very well. I was looking, living in a tiny room uh, in a house called the House of Ten Dumb Guys, um, which was a house a bunch of MIT students had bought uh, and lived in and rented out some of the spare rooms, uh, most of whom worked at Looking Glass with me. Uh, so I was living with a bunch of coworkers and uh, I had a tiny room and I quit Looking Glass one of those times that I quit Looking Glass. And I had a futon on the floor rather than a bed. And I started programming uh, sitting up on the futon uh, with the, uh, the CRT like sort of next to me, uh, right next to the futon uh, and the keyboard in my lap. And I just started programming that way to like try it and see. Yeah. And I started getting really bad uh, wrist problems um, very slowly. Like, you know, just slowly over time, my wrist just started getting worse and started getting worse. And, you know, it, it happened and I was actually like, well, you know, I have changed my you know, the way I sit. Uh, so let me get let me get a desk set up. Let me put all this stuff on the desk. Let me switch to typing on a desk. And it went away. And that's the entirety of my ever experience with uh, repetitive strain injury. So uh, my answer was I changed how I did it and it went away. So sorry. <laughs> well, that's fine. Um, and, you know, everybody has... Like Sean McGrath is also having his own issues. So, you know, each case, oh, yeah. it, it depends too much on the context. So I don't think he can give yep. you a very general answer or, or a prescription. No. I'm sorry. Um, next question comes from Miblo. And actually, this question embodies what the Handmade Dev community wanted to ask you for a long time. So take your time answering this. <laughs> what pieces of software, right? What pieces of projects? Oh, yeah, I saw this. Yeah, do you want to see made and that you don't have time to make yourself? Right. Well, we'll take it on. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I had a good answer. Um, again, in that other that little text uh, interview that I mentioned, uh, that there was a very speculative question about, you know, how, what would in your ideal world, what would be things be like? And my answer there was like, I make the libraries that I need. Um, so I don't have I don't have that much need for them. As soon as I perceive a need, I start writing the code like and and these days I tend to write them as the SDB libraries. Um, so there are lots of things that could be better, but I don't know that li STB libraries are the things that are going to make my life better. So I don't know that there's anything the handmade community can do about it. Okay. Um, and 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 so as long as I'm on that subject, I'll bring it up, and everyone from the handmade community will will, you know, nod and imagine the fantasy world where this was true, and <laughs> sigh at the fact we're never going to get there because we can't get everyone to be handmade developers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, which is the fantasy world where uh, all software works well. Um, so that the things I'm interacting with, the programs, not the libraries, but the programs are well behaved, uh, do what I want, aren't inefficient, um, don't use cumbersome ways of doing things, have the same workflow, uh, the operating system gets out of your way as much as possible. Uh, when programs and operating systems yes. update, they don't change yes. your workflow. You can just yes. keep using your existing yes. workflow. Uh, yes. Operating systems do not put barriers in the way like DRM yes. or other things, yes. uh, et cetera, et cetera. Right? This is all... You know, the fantasy world. And the interesting thing about that fantasy world is that was the world that I grew up in on the oh, Apex years. Yes, the computers exactly. were a lot less powerful. The things we could do then were much smaller, much more limited. But we just didn't have the total freedom. Everything got out of our way. Everything just worked. Nothing upgraded ever. It was all awesome for the very limited set of things you could do. I do not want to go back to then. I do not want to be stuck developing for the Atari 2600. But boy, you know, that's the thing. So, you know, that... You know, I signed up for the Handmade Dev. I probably didn't sign up right away, but you know, I contributed to the Handmade Dev Patreon very early. Um, yes, yes. The first version of this that I really saw was Casey's earlier manifesto, the Molly Rocket Manifesto, which is very different because it's about game design, but it's the same sort of like artisanal, you know, uh, devotion to quality. Um, and when I, I that what happened with the handmade thing, the reason I didn't sign up for the Patreon right away was because I didn't bother reading. Uh, and as soon as I saw the handmade manifesto, I was like, okay, yeah, that's exactly it. I'm I'm signing up. Um, and, and you know, because because you guys were these young guys, and I'm the old curmudgeon, so I was just like, yeah, whatever, handmade hero. That's all boring, uninteresting stuff from my perspective. Like, who cares? I I know all that stuff, so who cares? But, but the fact that you guys were taking this philosophy uh, to heart, that you that you um, that by whatever mechanism you believe in it uh, is, is so amazing to me. So, 
Oh, yes. And, you know, we're glad to hear that. You know, we, uh, I don't think you have access or you've gone to the IRC for Handmade Dev, but, you know. No, I haven't. But Okay. Yeah. We're always talking about, you know, Sean Barrett, you know, what projects would he, would he like us to do? So, you know, we really do appreciate uh, your input. So if you ever have anything to say, I think we'll pretty much get it done at this point. Um, just so you know there. Um, now, let's continue. I'm going to have to Sherry pick some questions because we're running out of time. But um, some of these questions are still, when are you going to stream again? So you, you might want to get into that. Even if it's just <laughs> STB, STB maintenance, I, I think we need a Sean fix here. So give, us, right. a, <laughs> give us a stream. Uh, OK, one question comes from uh, Dr. Jeets. And he's the one that linked the book earlier. Uh, so thank you. Can you think of any people in your early programming career that were really good mentors and have you ever mentored any new hires or people for example uh so let me answer the the, the second part first i've never mentored anyone um i did oversee someone else creating an stb library um there is one stb library that i didn't write and it has still had two stb libraries that i didn't write uh the other one is uh, something fabian rigorous wrote um and we put them under the STB moniker for brand reasons. I hate to say that. Right? <laughs> that sounds so terrible. But it's like, you know, it's an assurance of quality of, um, in, in, the, in the Fabian's case, he wrote the core and I adapted it into an STB library. So it was sort of my work. But the STB image resize um, yeah. uh, is a library that uh, Carmack, um, Carmack, when he left id, uh, and went to Oculus, had some of the same experiences I had, where he was like, oh, I wrote this software at id, and I don't have it anymore. Uh, I have to write it from scratch if I want it. He sort of had that uh, come to Jesus moment of, uh, with respect to the STB library idea, philosophy. And so he <laughs> tweeted this, uh, what would be really useful is a library for image resizing that was just simple, trivial to use, you just throw it in, doesn't have to be the optimal, you know, whatever, because lots of people spend lots of time on trying to make their image resizers optimal. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so some random guy who follows me saw that and he was like, I really think I'm the guy to make that library. And he contacted me and he said, you know, I want to make this library. I don't remember the process exactly, but I, so I guided him through the API design uh, in some crucial ways uh, that make it way more usable. Um, and I did some optimizations on it because he was not a super optimizing guy because he was, you know, I don't know, I don't want to say anything specific about him, but I presume he had not a lot of experience with this kind of coding. Uh, I, and yes. um, and I, I don't know if you can call that mentoring exactly, but, you know, it's a, it was a conversational thing. I wasn't just going in and fixing his code. I was, hey, maybe if you did it this way, you know. Right. Um, and, and that I'm comfortable with doing. Um, uh, helping people make STB-esque libraries if they're willing to go down the... They don't have to brand it STB, but if they are willing to make public domain single file libraries that are usable from C, just because um, you know, it doesn't have to be usable from VC6, uh, you know, that's what I need for it to work. I'm not requiring people to do that, uh, but making it usable from C does mean that other languages can use it because exactly. they can't use plus APIs. So if they're willing to go that that mile, uh, and I think they uh, have a clue what they're doing, I am totally willing to help sort of oversee and um, help out with the API design. I think that's the most important thing I can contribute at this point because um, I'm relatively good at it, apparently. Uh, so um, that level of mentoring uh, is something uh, that I'm willing to do. You guys, uh, you got it. Hurry up. Hurry up and contact him. <laughs> oh my God. That's exciting. And there, <laughs> and there is on GitHub an issue on my on the STB uh, repository that is libraries other people have asked for. So while I don't have any specific libraries I would like, uh, there is a list you can look at of ideas for libraries that some people would be interested in. If you wanted to try your hand at writing an STB-like library, um, you're welcome to look at that list and ask for my advice on the API design. And you know that could be a more tighter relationship there if need be. It's pretty awesome. And uh, I think we only have time for two more questions, so I'm sorry about that. I'm going to pick two more questions. One, which I think was going to come up anyway, so let's just get, get it over with. Um, would you consider switching to JAI? And for those who don't know, JAI is a programming language being developed by Jonathan Blow, the creator of Braid and The Witness. Uh, or, Sean Barrett, or will you consider keep using C forever? <sighs> Um, I'm afraid that the correct answer to this might eat up too much time, but I'm going to give That's the correct fine. answer anyway. Go over five minutes. Yeah. So uh, in the mid-2000s, when I was a solo developer, I got a little frustrated with C. 
Um, it was, it's really cumbersome to get some stuff done. Uh, and I started designing my own language. And what oh. I was designing this language for was the opposite of what John was designing uh, JAI to do. Do we have any idea how to pronounce JAI? Um, and that JAI is designed for game development. That's his very explicit goal. And my language was, I'm going to write my games in C. This is my language I use for tools. Because tools are where, it's that thing I was talking about, when I'm writing a small thing, having to deal with all the cumbersome overheads of stuff is annoying, and C had some of those for me. <laughs> and uh, so an example of this, back in the DOS days, when there was no virtual memory, so we had 64 megabytes of memory, and that was the memory, you could malloc 64 megas, megs and you were done. If you tried to malloc more, the malloc returned null, and that, that's what you got. Yeah. Um, and so what I did back in those days, early on, when I was writing tools, uh, certain kinds of programs, because it was DOS, there was only one program running at a time, what I would do is I would like make some static arrays. I would, you know, static int x sub a million or whatever. And I would exactly pick the numbers I would type for the amount of memory that was on my machine so that it used up basically all of my memory. And that way that tool could do as much as it could do in the memory that was available. And I didn't yes. have to deal with malloking and freeing. It was just a static array, it just got out of my way. Oh. Um, but, and then you know, the next machine that I had had 256 megs and I tried to go use that old program and I would go like change the numbers in it so it would now use a larger array. Yeah. Um, really dumb way to program, but you know, got the job done yeah, really and well. I didn't have to spend a lot of time on it. I just wrote the static array. So this is a classic C memory management strat strategy is you just define these global arrays. So the problem is that they're global. So like if your program has two phases and it first needs to use all the memory for this thing and then needs to use all the memory for that thing, these statically created arrays are terrible because they're, you know, all always allocated. So you can only use half as much memory. So it's not ideal. But it's how I worked around the problem. I wanted to build a tool quickly, I would do that. So in the mid-2000s, this is the very first SDB library before SDB image. Um, I was kind of running into that and I was like, you know, like computers are fast, yeah. uh, but malloc and realloc are really painful. Like, you know, I could malloc an array if I needed it, but the whole reallocing thing when I don't know how big it is and I have to keep reallocating is just really tedious. Uh, C++ has a thing called vector in the STL that's an expandable array um, that's much more convenient to use. It just automatically expands. If you don't care about it because you're running a tool, you're not trying to be super optimal, you're just trying to be reasonably optimal. You just, you just keep pushing stuff back on your vector and everything just magically works. <laughs> yeah. And in, and in C, you can do this, but you have to use realloc. You want it to double. You want to keep growing the size by double. So you have this a pointer, and you have a size, and you have a capacity. So you have these three variables. And I would always have these programs I was writing that had these three variables for every array. And I'd have like four global arrays or something. And I would do all this work. Okay. Okay. And this was all kind of cumbersome. Boy, what is the question that I'm answering at this point? <laughs> The question was, you know, would you switch over to a language? Ah, yes. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Okay, so um, so I, I told you this answer was going to take the whole time. So, no problem. Um, so eventually I'm like, I should systematize this. I can make a struct that has the array and the, the size and the capacity stored in the struct. But now the problem is to like, to, you want to type safe when you do you reference your yeah, array when you take an sure. array reference you want it you don't want to like cast through some macros and have to cast it. it should just magically work and if it's packed in a struct i can't easily like make macros that do the right thing in the struct. it just looked like a nightmare um and i figured out this trick that i could do where you just store one pointer and the pointer points to this block of memory that keeps expanding gets relocated and expands and right before the pointer it stores the extra day it needs the length of the array and the size that's been allocated so it knows when it needs to double it and I created that little, uh, and some macros that then emulate the C++ vector right. functionality. So I could push to the end, I could find the length. I didn't even bother implementing most of the vector types, because really all I needed almost always was just pushing a new thing on the end and have it just automatically double without me having to pay attention to realloc, with it just doing the right thing, all being type safe. And I wrote this little set of macros. Uh, and I was like, okay, this is uh, helpful. Uh, let me put this into this... Uh, stb.h, I called it, um, which was just all the functions that I thought I might use all the time. I'll just put them in one file so I don't have to worry about it. Yes. Uh, and that was that was the first one that I put in. And uh, once I had that, and then I eventually put in a string hash table, so it just maps the string with a hash table to an arbitrary pointer. Once I had those two things, when I would write tools in C using that, I suddenly found that I had my productivity back to 100%. 
uh, for for writing oh, tools. I see. Okay. Uh, so I had so I, I mentioned I started designing a language just for tools, and the idea was that it would be garbage collected and would have arrays that automatically were sized, and they would do right, all these right. things and all this stuff. So I didn't have to worry about them wearing tools. But it, by and that was I worked on that. I had an interpreter. It was partly written. The syntax in JAI for. Um, Variable uh, initialization versus variable assignment, where you use colon equals, but you can leave out some of the fields with that. That comes from my language, okay. um, yeah, uh, I because I had I had gone a little ways down, and and when very early in his design, I emailed him that idea, and he doesn't like syntax. Uh, people suggesting syntax because who cares about syntax? But it was early enough in the project that he went ahead and took that idea on, um, and. So I had gone down that path, but I like was nowhere near done. And you know, I need a debugger and I need all that stuff. And so instead, I made this stv.h, and I suddenly found that just those two data structures uh, totally changed my tool programming. That was just magic. I just no longer cared about tools. I don't want to use stv.h in a game because it's doing a realloc under the hood, and if the realloc fails, the whole program will crash. If it runs out of memory, you're do you're done. Like you can't use that my vector type for that thing. It's it's. The way it's all macroized, it can't help dereferencing null at that point. Okay. Um, so you, you can't use it in a like a shippable quality thing in theory. I'm actually using it on uh, the, an editor that I'm making for Rad, uh, and if the editor runs out of memory, it's going to crash. Like, all right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so um, so so that was all explaining how I started down the path of writing a language for that stuff and ended up deciding that C was good enough if I augmented C with this one thing. Yes. Uh, and SGB.ih has now grown into every all this extra awesome, interesting stuff and lots of terrible stuff and stuff nobody should ever <laughs> use. It's just a giant mess because it was just all the stuff I thought of trying. Um, and it is part of the GitHub stuff, but it's the one I tell people not to use to the largest extent. It's like, this is my personal stuff. You, you can use it. Uh, people do use it. People have submitted patches for it. It's totally usable, but I continue to want to fork it back to just the data structures that really make a difference and you know maybe some of the file handling that really makes a difference and all the experimental stuff that's also in there. Anyway, so to the answer the actual question, would I use it? So sort of my initial reaction was like, no, I had sort of the opposite you know, feeling. I that, that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but as watching him develop it, there's definitely some things he's done in there that are hugely valuable for highly optimized stuff. As an indie game developer, I'm not sure I need to go down the level of optimization that he's concerned oh, about as much. I you know, there's a, there's some stuff like there's this thing called data oriented uh, design, data oriented mm -hmm. programming, yeah, whatever it's called. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, he's got some stuff in there for making uh, a array of structure, structure of array stuff yes, smarter. Absolutely. That's that's totally awesome. And you know, like in the SDV voxel render demos, maybe uh, I really was pushing uh, performance to the point that that would have been useful. But most of the indie game development I do, I don't even pay attention to performance. I'm just doing some 2D OpenGL immediate mode stuff, and it's all always fast enough, and I just don't care. Um, so I, you know, it's hard to say that the stuff I do currently would make any sense. However, all that being said, um, I don't like some of the things he's doing in it, but I like enough of the things he's doing in it that I, uh, I imagine I will get behind any push uh, to it. And if that getting behind it involves, you know, helping write sample code or write rewrite projects, you know, I might do it for that reason, not because I need it personally, but because uh, it's helpful to the project. Um, you know, he's never mentioned this. I'm just like saying, I'm totally yes, yes. here. Um, and certainly if what he ends up with looks good enough, I I imagine I would switch. Like, um, it, it, it's, uh, it's really hard to say because I'm a very stick in the mud person. I tend to stick with software for a long time. I'm still using PC6. Uh, I still wow. use a, an ancient email program. And the reason I use those things is because the workflow is better. And oh my God, oh. I have a huge tangent here that I better not do. Um, so uh, uh, it's possible that I'm lying here because I am enough of a curmudgeon. Maybe I would just stay away from it because I don't want to switch. Uh, but I don't, uh, there's nothing in the project that makes me say it's not worth switching to. Uh, exactly. It's just a question of whether he gets it done. There are things I don't like, but there are things I don't like. It's it, like, you know, there's not, there's no drawback that makes it bad. And there's clear support, uh, clear advantages. Um, so I would think uh, if there was, uh, if it was realistic to switch to it, I would certainly explore it um, and might switch. So there you go. Nice, nice. Um, and, you know, oh, thank goodness you're drinking because this is my last piece of glass. 
So I've run out of wine, and when you run out of wine, it's time to end the stream. So I'm gonna ah. give you, I'm gonna give you one more question, and we'll finish the stream with that. But oh my God, there's so much to talk about, and so many questions we couldn't get to. I don't know if you're okay with coming back sometime later this year. Um, uh, absolutely. All right, and finish off our conversation because my God, there's a lot to talk about here. Um, so okay, last question that I'm gonna pick is from Serge. Uh, Serge RGB, Sergio, he is a good programmer, I believe. He, I think he um, interned for Google and you know he's been doing uh, interesting work for Handmade Dev. His question to Sean is, you seem to have a very unique lifestyle. And then he cites examples, like you have a vampire schedule <laughs> um, and so on. How do you think walking off the beaten path or just doing things that people, I guess, would do normally has impacted your happiness. Um, yeah. Um, so, so uh, let me give the, the bogus answer first. Okay. So as is well known, research has shown that people adapt their happiness uh, to their situation automatically and sustain the same happiness level uh, regardless of what's going on. So of course, I'm just as happy as I would be no matter what. It's an inherent thing to the person and isn't really about their situation. However, there I also, that's well known, has been circulated a lot. And I recently read something casting doubt on that, all that research. So I don't remember the details of what I read that cast doubt on it. So, so you can't, you can't get out with that answer. That was, that's the easy cheesy answer that you use yeah. to escape that question. Uh, and I wanted to get that out of the way. So the actual answer, um, uh, let me drill down into one example, the vampire schedule. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, the vampire schedule started when I was in college. Uh, I started being stuck. I was in a dorm and I would be in the dorm lounge late at night when nobody else was there. And I just, I don't remember. I, I, my memory is really terrible. So I don't really remember what I did with my time or how I dealt yeah. with this. I definitely, I definitely made my, uh, I tried to avoid morning classes, but I would just be stuck. Like there's nobody else awake and I'm awake and I can't do anything. And it's not exactly insomnia, but, um, uh, I don't remember really why that why that started happening or how I really dealt with it. I don't really remember the details. Okay. But but uh, at Looking Glass, um, I started into a thing where I would get later and later every day, and uh, my schedule would sort of shift. And you know, um, at some point they were like kind of made explicit, like, "Hey guys, you really need to be here at least." Uh, I don't remember what they said, but let's say 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. You have to overlap. You have to overlap that window. Was sort of the idea, like so that there's some time for everyone to communicate. You know, that was sort of the idea. And I don't know if that was his response to me or if there were other people doing it or whatever. Um, and my best guess, I honestly don't remember exactly what I did, but I, my recollection is that my schedule would slip, and when I was about to miss the window, I would pull an all nighter, wrap around to the next window, uh, and then sort of reset my schedule back, and it would start drifting again. Oh, okay. Um, so it felt in college like it was a nighttime thing, a vampire thing. Uh, and and it, looking last, it was very explicitly this rolling schedule that was shifting in time. It's fascinating. <laughs> now, uh, after looking last, when I was in indie dev, I could just do whatever I wanted. I could program whenever I wanted. I didn't have a huge social life, so it didn't really matter when I was awake. Um, and uh, so I intentionally let myself drift at that point. Um, I never set the alarm. I would just wake up when I would wake up. Uh, and that was a huge morale boost, um, uh, you know, happiness boost potentially, uh, because I, I, I can't nail down concretely, but it just always felt like when I was being woken up by an alarm, I was just not productive. You know, I was a little grumpier or whatever for some amount of time. This is the life that most of you lead, and maybe you have this problem or maybe you don't. Um, you know, maybe this is a universal thing that I just have worked around, or maybe it was unique, to, a little more unique to me. But I, it just did not work well. I was not as productive, um, and uh, and being productive makes me happier. So, um, you know, I make the STB libraries because they make me happy. Um, it's not a selfless thing. Like helping other people makes me happy, right? It's this weird, messed up thing. So, um, so in that same way, uh, uh, th this was a. F it's absolutely true that um, taking that that uh, allowing the that schedule freedom uh, did, did increase my happiness. It's one hundred percent why I went down that. It did come at the sort of expense of ever developing a social life. So um, you know, not I don't know how that trade off shakes out one hundred percent, but 
it certainly feels like uh, the right thing for improving my happiness. And that's a deep drill into one aspect of that. And you were sort of asking in general, and and that the general question is too hard to answer. So I just thought thought that would be useful to to give it a specific. Oh yeah, sure. I, I enjoyed that remark actually. Um, well, close to two hundred viewers. I'm sorry that I have to end it here. Um, but how about we finish off with one question from my part, Sean? Uh, and, well, let me just, be, oh, before sure, we sign, sure, before the yeah. sign-off happens, I just want to say, I will stick around and chat. So if people aim questions at me, which is nothing's too, so that I see them, you'll have to re-ask any old questions. Uh, I'll see them. So af after the stream ends, uh, I will do that. Please do. So if you have any questions that I definitely skipped over, I'm sorry, uh, ask them to Sean at nothing's too, please. Uh, moderators, please uh, give, him, uh, give the username to him, uh, to the chat, I'm sorry. Anyway, so my question would be, what would you say to all these young programmers, you know, from the handmade dev community, you know, with your experience, what kind of advice, what piece of advice would you give them uh, in order to become, I guess, a better programmer, in order to sort of fulfill their <laughs> their life dreams or something like that? So let's end with that. Let's end the stream with that uh, question for you. <laughs> I, you know, I... You know, people ask like, you know, what books should I read to be able to do X or what should I, you know, and I'm like, I don't know. I don't read any of those books, right? And <laughs> I, I, I kind of feel like that about that whole question. Like uh, everyone is a unique snowflake and um, I'm not in a position that I can judge what is going to work for other people. Um, yeah, but clearly a lot of people look up to you, right? So you yeah, but that's know a, your thoughts. <laughs> But my thoughts are about what works for me, not what works for them. <laughs> I, 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 no, honestly, I, I, I really don't think the, it's that useful. Um, um, like, can we get? Uh, can you do you have a more specific version of that question so that I have something that I can actually like kind of? Sure. Why not? Nail okay. down. All right. So let's say somebody is really interested in becoming uh, an experienced C programmer, and by experienced I mean they are able to develop these large scale projects one day in their in their career just as the software rendering um, graphics part of the Thief project, right? What things yeah. would be good habits to develop in order to get that point, to get it done? Yeah, and, and that's exactly what I was talking about, is that um, I know how I got here, but I don't think that generalizes. And so it's really hard for me to, I don't want to give advice that's bad advice, and I have no idea that any <laughs> advice I give would not be bad advice. That's fair I, enough. I, I, this is not me trying to dodge the question. If yeah. somebody wants to know how did what did you do to get here, I'll answer that. When, as long as everyone understands that I am not saying this is the right thing to do. And unfortunately, it's not very interesting. Like it's not. I don't think there's gonna be anything actionable if I actually went down that path. So. Okay, that's fair enough. Well, you must have. I, I'm, I'm sorry. To, I'm just dodging the whole question. But I'm only dodging <laughs> it because I honestly do not feel qualified to answer it. I mean, which I know yeah. sounds like a cheat, but. <laughs> no, 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 and and that's a. Uh... You know, we understand that. So, um, you know, something I do think, though, is that you've shown and, you know, I'm going to go ahead and sort of answer the question for you. And then you can say, Ooh, yes, or Ooh, no. Um, yeah, but so go, go ahead. Go ahead and do that. But remind me that I do have a thing I want to say on the subject. Uh, but, okay. go ahead, but you go ahead and do yours first. OK, so, you know, some of the things that are common threads among programmers like yourself is that they just truly do enjoy the process of making these products happen, right? As opposed to trying to do it because you think the product will give you a level of success or a level of financial success. Um, and then that's why you're gonna do it, right? So you, you, do really, you really do enjoy the process onto itself as, as its own thing. And that's what drives you, I suppose, one of the things that drives you to actually uh, fulfill these products uh, to their, uh, to their whole, just because you do enjoy it. And so if you feel that you're a programmer that doesn't truly enjoy uh, getting a software renderer <laughs> done for your 3D game, or a programmer that enjoys the process of pushing out a game and shipping it through the whole, you know, kind of uh, steps that you have to do, then it's probably not for you. And that doesn't mean that you're not, you can't be a good programmer. It's just that that's just not the field for you. If you don't really, if you can't match your passion, right, with your career in that kind of way. So I, I, I maybe agree with that, um, that the, the thing is that yeah, I'm really used to that world where, yeah, where, where everyone um, that I, in my peer group who programs, um, loves to program. Like it is satisfactory experience in and of itself. But I do not in any way want to imply that 
um, only programmers who uh, enjoy it at that level can be 10x programmers. To, again, me, I don't even know if 10x programming is a thing, right? I like just spe speculatively assuming it's a thing. You could imagine that all the 10x programmers are people for whom that's true. And anybody who's just like getting programming as a job is never going to be a 10x programmer. But I don't, even, assuming 10x programmers even exist, I don't actually know that's true. Maybe somebody is really good at programming but doesn't really enjoy it. And, you know, they could be an awesome programmer anyway, even though it's not like, I just don't know. Like, that's just weird. And, uh, I can even drill down into that a little bit. Uh, yeah. Sorry to extend your no, stream no beyond the amount you meant. But yeah. uh, when I was in high school, uh, yeah, that was when I started programming in high school. And everyone knew, I, I went to a tiny high school. So um, I had, uh, we had 40 students per, uh, per year. And so we, uh, you knew everyone else in the year. And all the teachers knew basically all the students. And everyone knew I was really good at math and computers. Um, to the point that you know, like uh, my SAT scores, everyone was surprised I had a high verbal SAT score because they just thought I was a math guy. And um, the uh, the thing that I experienced in going through high school was I took to computers like the fish to water, but I was also very good at pure math. Um, and I actually like I went to university for some like, math courses. It wasn't like really university math. It's a crazy thing. But yeah. uh, there was a, that's the uh, state that I lived in had a math competition for high school students um, that you know, it was totally voluntary. But, uh, you know, the, the people there at my school pushed me to enter it. And I forget what I, I think I placed 10th when I was a junior for my state. And maybe uh, it was top 10, I think. I might have even been like five, top five, uh, mm -hmm. my senior year or something like that. So, of all the math students in my state, which was a not that small, that large a state, Maryland, uh, I was you know fifth or whatever. Um, which, like, when you think about it across the whole country, it's not like I was the number one mathematician or anything, but I was pretty like way past on the bell curve. But the thing that I had found was that I didn't particularly enjoy mathematics. Oh. It wasn't something I actually like to do. So when I was faced with the decision of what do I want to do with my life, um, there was never any doubt. Like I had no interest in going into mathematics. I was really good at it, but it was like, you know, and now my math skills have atrophied and I'm not as good at it as I used to be. Um, but uh, uh, and of course, you, and you use math and computers and they're related and all that stuff. But um, it was like just this clear, like there was never any doubt in my mind. Of course, it helps that mathematics, pure mathematics is not like a, a profitable thing the way computer science clearly right. was. So it's not like I was making a hard choice there between the, the, the profession where I get rich and the profession where I do what I love. But um, there was just never any doubt in my mind. I was going to be a computer programmer. As I said, I didn't even major in computer science. I knew I was going to be a computer programmer, but there was no reason to major in computer science in college because like that was just, you know, that was just a foregone conclusion because I was both good at it and loved it. So, so absolutely what you're saying is true um, in one sense. Uh, but there is definitely this thing of, yeah, you can be really good at something and maybe you can find happiness in your life with an eight, a nine to five job programming, being really good at programming and not loving it. That said, yeah, I feel like, I feel like there's, I said this very early, I feel like there's this correlation between being the handmade mentality and being the, the, the I love to program kind of person. Um, it feels like that, that obsession with quality, uh, that devotion to the cause. Uh, it, to put it kind of in religious terms, um, is something that's correlated, but I, that's speculation, and I don't actually know. Um, uh, and and I remember the point I wanted to go back to if yes, we're done with do. that one. Please do. So the point I wanted to go back to is um, I actually contrast myself with Casey um, uh, very strongly. I, for similarly, everyone watching this is familiar with Casey Miratori and Handmade Hero. Um, of course. So Casey and I are friends. Um, we have worked together on uh, an open source projects in very small ways. Um, uh, he helped me a little bit on my project at Red. And um, uh, so we get along fine. We use each other's libraries fine. It's all well and good. Uh, but I very uh, strongly disagree with um, his sort of, uh, not disagree with, I, I have a totally contrasting philosophy. Um, I'm, I'm very much, um, I don't know what's right. I don't know what's right for you guys. Um, this is what works for me. And Casey is very much, this is the right way to do it. You should be doing this. Uh, and I'm not saying that either of those approaches is correct. I just like kind of want to call out that it's kind of an interesting contrast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that I, you know, deep down, I believe my way is right. I just don't say it. Uh, it's <laughs> definitely there's definitely a little of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but but there's uh, there is also just some you know, uh, it's not. Um, 
it's not humility for the sake of show. Like, I know I don't know everything. Um, I've been wrong in the past. I, I don't want to push people the wrong way. Um, so I, it, I, there is room for uh, differences of opinion here, even while we like share many of the same things. Like, as I said, the, the Molly Rocket Manifesto was uh, 100% gold for, for me. So like, I totally support all of those things. Almost everything he recommends, uh, specific things he recommends, I agree with. Um, sometimes I disagree with them, um, but uh, the philosophy is absolutely different in some sense. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Ooh, this has been amazing. Um, I don't know if you have anything else to say before we end the stream. Um, uh, but, like, thank you so much for being here. Uh, everybody has enjoyed this thoroughly. I can tell through their messages to me and the Twitter DMs and things like that. So we're definitely going to have you back again uh later in the year because we we have so much to cover still right but i hope you enjoy handmade dev when the website comes out and that you we we can provide you with software that you said before that will be performant that will be quality that you know will make you understand that we're trying our best here uh to give a quality experience for end users of their computers and with that uh thank you guys for being here in the handmade dev show uh thank you for asking questions to Sean, and we will make sure that next Saturday we have another guest with you, um, with us, um, here on the Handmade Dev Show. Give me a follow on Twitter if you want to know who my next guest is going to be in the coming days, or just go ahead and subscribe here on Twitch, and you will know when I stream again the next time. And like Sean Barrett said, if you have questions, and I know it's a lot of questions that I missed, that you want uh, Sean to answer, he said he's going to be on the chat, is that correct? Um, yep. he's, he's going to be on the chat. He's going to be answering those questions for you. So please ask them again. You know, Miblo, Fjallkan, who, whoever else was asking questions that I couldn't get to. So thank you again. Sean, I will end the call right now, but we will keep talking on the chat as well. Okay? Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. All right, this was awesome. See you guys next Saturday. Take care. This was the Handmade Dev Show.